Um, I'm just going to be quickly introducing me flat up there. Talking to the mic. Talking to the mic. Talking to the mic. Um, I'm going to introduce Platypus and then talk here to my right with moderating. Um, Platypus is a self-educational project we started back in 2007. Actually, the first time that we did this event was in 2007. It was our second public forum. And uh, at the time, the anti-war movement was ongoing. And so these issues, specifically the category of resistance, we thought had become a problematic category on the left. And so, in part, um, we do these public fora in order to investigate the political imagination of our time. Our panels and our Platypus Review, our newspaper, which is over there, are curated in the spirit of history, um, are curated in the spirit of presenting different perspectives on the left in order to illuminate, clarify the kind of political imagination of the present. Um, so the guiding curatorial spirit is that we don't want people to agree with each other on our panels. So productive disagreement is welcome. Okay, we have um, some activities that we do in New York. We have chapters in New York and Chicago and Canada, overseas in different countries like Germany and the UK, and most recently our uh, New York member in Japan is going to be holding uh, in Greece and New Delhi, and I mean, we have a lot of chapters, but uh, most recently our New York member who's in Japan is setting up some coffee breaks in Japan, and we have a couple of members in Korea who are doing that as well. Um, so if you'd like to get involved, find out more about what we're doing, you can approach any of us or you can sign up, uh, the list will be passed around. Uh, you can find out about events in New York. But two quick announcements about New York events. There's going to be one event on May 2nd. It's going to be called The Day After. We're going to have people who have been part of Occupy organizing, as spectators, commentators, sort of come together and talk about what they experienced on May 1st. That's going to happen at NYU. And then the second event that's coming up is on May 7th, and it's going to be a book talk with author Richard Wolin who wrote about um, his Maoist intellectuals in France and Europe. We're going to be having a conversation with him on May 7th. Both of the events will be at NYU. Apart from that, we have weekly reading group meetings and coffee breaks, which are more sort of informal conversations about politics, etc. And we encourage you to come drop by and talk to us. OK, that's all. Without further ado, talk. Thank you, Pam. Um, so as uh, Pam said, my name is uh, Pac Kobrick, and I'm a member of the Platypus Affiliate Society. I'm an editor of the Platypus Review, which Pam uh, noted are over there and they're free. Uh, they're also online, uh, published monthly. Um, and let me uh, actually just give a bit of unfortunate news to begin. Um, Professor John Asmokopoulos, who's supposed to speak on this panel, uh, emailed me uh, earlier this afternoon to let me know that he, in fact, will be able to make it. So we'll make do without uh, Professor Asmokopoulos. Uh, but we have. Uh, uh, or the other three panelists here, and I'm sure we'll have a good, uh, vigorous, and interesting debate. Um, so um, let me begin, in fact, by introducing the panelists um, uh, from your left uh, over to your right. Um, Professor Todd Gitlin, uh, far, my far right, um, was the third president of the Students for Democratic Society, teaches at Columbia University, and his latest book, Occupy Nation, The Roots, the Spirit, and the Promise of Occupy Wall Street, will be available as an ebook on May 1st and as a paperback on August 21st. Uh, Tom Trache is actually on your far right, uh, is a Marxist and a longtime activist in the socialist and the labor movements. Uh, at Fordham University, he was a founding member of the radical student group Progressive Student Alliance, a uh, former member of the United Federation of Teacher and of ASMA, is that right? AFSCME. AFSCME, AFSCME, uh, DC 37. Uh, he's active today in the New York City Government Employees Union Organization of the Staff Analysts. Uh, and he serves on the National Committee of Workers, uh, I'm sorry, National Committee of the Workers International League, uh, and on the editorial board of the WIL's publication, Socialist Appeal. Uh, and his articles are also regularly published by the International Marxist Tendency on Marxist.com. And Ross Wolf in the center here is a graduate student at the University of Chicago, focusing on early Soviet history, Marxism and critical theory, avant-garde uh, avant art and architecture, uh, contemporary political issues such as activism, anti-capitalism, and environmentalism, and radical utopianism. Um, a quick word on the structure of the panel. Um, the panelists will each have up to uh, 15 minutes to speak. Uh, they can take as much time as is necessary uh, within that frame. Uh, Jamie here uh, will um, alert you guys as to when you have two minutes left and then when your time is up, uh, if you uh, reach that 15 minute mark. Um, and uh, after the panel, um, after the panelists speak, I may have a question or two, depending on uh, 
how much time is taken up and if there are questions in the audience uh, as well. There, if there are a lot of questions, we'll move directly to that. Um, and just quickly, I'm going to read to you guys uh, what we sent the panelists as a prompt for, uh, uh, for their talks here. Um, uh, there are several questions here, uh, and I'll just read them off here. And they're actually the same questions uh, as they were posed in 2007 when we first did this event. Um, so, since the 1960s, and especially since the 1990s, struggles for social, economic, and political emancipation have been conceived less in terms of structural reforms or revolutionary transformation, and more in terms of resistance. How do you define resistance, and how do you understand its role in possibilities for social change? One powerful way resistance has been conceived has been in terms of culture and practices of everyday life. How do you understand the implicit, if not explicit, distinction uh, thus made of politics directed at society as a whole from the more apparently mundane concerns and stakes of quotidian existence? What, in your understanding, are the reasons for and consequences of this historical shift away from movements for reform or revolutionary politics to tactics, strategies, and self-understandings in terms of resistance? Where do the new forms of political resistance point, in your estimation, for social emancipatory possibilities today and in the future? What kinds of change do you envision on the horizon of present social concerns? How do you imagine political manifestations of such change? And finally, what can and should those on the left, those interested in working towards social emancipation, do tactically and strategically in light of such possibilities for change? So uh, on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Professor Gitlin, and he will start us off here. to offer. I'm going to try to be brisk and summary rather than expansionist and uh, elaborating. But in the spirit of this conversational enterprise, uh, I hope to instigate some light, if not heat. Um, I want to talk about let me, I, I think I want to start with the concept of resistance. Um, the concept of resistance is, is, is one of the, if, if you pardon me, God terms of, in the history of the left. Um, I know it certainly was in my in political beginnings. Um, if there was a, a founding myth in my sense of what it meant to affiliate with the left, when I was in college, it was in the idea of the French resistance. And the French resistance didn't really need an explanation. You, you, you simply had to say the word resistance, and what was connoted, what was automatically there, was that which it was a resistance to. The resistance was to absolute unfathomable evil. And so it was self-evident what resistance amounted to. So resistance was not so much a position, but uh, a way of life, uh, a way of living, a way of conducting oneself in relation to the entirety of the world. So as you can tell, uh, the idea of resistance that I uh, sort of more or less gravitated to was the idea that was associated with the intellectuals who were known at the time as the existentialists. And their premise was that um, resistance was not so much a political position, in fact, they were not very interested in developing political positions, but was something between uh, a declaration of value and a form of action. Resistance was not something you believed. It was not something you articulated as a set of um, political propositions. It was not an analysis, although it could incorporate elements of analysis. It was a way of living, resistance. And I think I was not alone in feeling that the concept of resistance was of the essence of the left. And in fact, it was the vitality of this is a time, I'm now talking about the early 1960s. 
when the, the ideological significance of the left was at low ebb in the United States. Um, there was very little of what you could call an organized left. And the remnants of earlier lefts uh, that existed seem to be uh, animated, if that's the right word, by a kind of automatic sentiment, a series of slogans about the wrongness of capitalism and, and so on, but seem to be an inert force. The, the, the idea of the left was a kind of exercise of sentiment, whereas the idea of resi resistance uh, seem to convey something both more ambitious and, le and, and less well-defined. And that was actually an advantageous. Resistance was a style at least as much as it was a politics. In fact, I would say more than it was a politics. And so it wasn't surprising uh, that a few years later, in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Movement and after the startup of the anti-war movement, that the terminology of resistance reemerged, this time as the core of some of the central tendencies within the anti-war movement. Uh, the word resistance emerged in the form of the slogan, From Protest to Resistance, which was an SDS slogan circa 1966-67. Protest is the generic popular culture term for dissidents, opposition, and so on. Uh, the idea of that slogan was to convey the idea that uh, we were not simply uh, going to object to a, some awful policies, uh, some awful structures, some awful developments, but we're actually going to take action to try to to obstruct. Uh, protest to resistance was, was not the only form in which resistance of, emerged during this period as a kind of bellwether or a kind of hallmark of the spirit of the left. It was at this time that the movement uh, of draft resistance began. It was quite explicit what draft resistance meant. Draft resistance was, again, a form of action was not so much an analysis, or not even very much at all, an analysis of uh, the draft system. It was certainly uh, not identical to, although it might overlap with, a theory about what the war in Vietnam was about, and about American imperialism, and so on. Draft resistance was, uh, was a kind of spirited and uh, intentional action that, uh, that, that it was a declaration of, uh, of, of a way of being more than it was an articulation of a position. Um, and in, the, in this fashion, uh, I think the concept of resistance served us well uh, as a declaration that we were more than a discussion group. We were more than a study group. We were more than a position or a body of positions. We were more than a um, uh, than a um, uh, than, than, than a text. We were we were, as we said at the time, a movement. Um, I've come to think now, I, and I retain. Uh, you'll tell from the rest of my remarks. I retain a very uh, intense. Uh, respect for and, and allegiance to the idea of resistance. Uh, however, uh, for reasons we can go into if you're interested, I've come to think that the concept of resistance is not an adequate foundation for, it's not an adequate intellectual foundation for a political movement. And the reason is, that the idea of resistance is, a, is an idea of dependency. That is, the idea of resistance implies the existence of some entity, some structure, some force, some policy, some world, political world, which, uh, which inspires and in, indeed requires opposition. 
Resistance is always attached to that which it resists. And as I say, I, I think that as a, as, a, as a cultural stance, as a moral stance, that is fully justifiable. But it is not an intellectual position. Um, and it sometimes leads, I think, to some very bad uh, attachments insofar as uh, there's a tendency on the left to say that that which resists my enemy, I affiliate with, because it is, in fact, the resistance. It seems to me that that is a, um, a bankrupt intellectual stance because it makes you dependent upon that which you oppose. It is, it, it is a deprivation of autonomy. Um, let me develop a few ideas, therefore, about what I think affirmatively a left is, and then conclude with a few remarks about the Occupy movement. I think that the left is an ensemble of ideals, analysis, and forms of action. What made the new left was not that it had especially new ideas. And in fact, it's interesting to contemplate the Port Huron statement 50 years afterward and observe that most of it consists of a set of analytical ideas and diagnoses of particular flaws in American society. There's nothing especially original or engaging and compelling about those ideas. They are a mishmash of liberal and social democratic ideas. I don't, when I say mishmash, I don't mean to say that I disapprove of them. I, generally approve of them, but that, 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 that is not what made the new left new. What made the new left new, and therefore alive, and therefore a historical force, was that it affirmed that there were forms of action that it made sense to take. And these forms of action were not only oppositional, they were also creative. Uh, I think this was actually the great genius of the new left that it devised forms of action, not all of which by any means were original either, but they had the virtue of displaying or, or, or a performing or enacting a, a way of life which was held to be a superior way of life. The genius of the idea of a sit-in, for example, a sit-in to integrate a lunch counter, or to integrate segregated buses, was not that it had anything especially remarkable to say about the wrongness of white supremacy. That was, of course, what it affirmed. But what was significant is the way in which it affirmed that value. And the way it affirmed that value was not by making a demand on authorities to cease discrimination, segregation, and so on. The genius of the idea of the sit-in was that it actually took an act, it actually demonstrated that segregation, white supremacy, and so on could actually be abolished right here and now. And you did that by going someplace, going to a lunch counter where you weren't supposed to be, and sitting down, and acting as though the system of segregation no longer uh, existed. This was, this kind of idea was absorbed into the new left through radical pacifists uh, who have their own lineage um, and who were enormously influential in developing not only the styles but many of the persons uh, who were central to the civil rights movement. Uh, and it was during this, you know, so I, I seem to me that the, um, it was not, again, to underscore this point, it was not that the that the movement had worked out a correct analysis that made it interesting, that made it vital, that made it a force. It was that it had somehow found a way to affiliate a, a, an understanding of the world, at least a rudimentary understanding of the world, with a form of action that could actually address it. Um, the left is an organism. It is not a belief system. Um, and as an organism, it thrives on a platform which is not the left. 
What I mean is that most people in any given society are living in a framework in a framework of life which they aim to conserve. People have people live lives which represent to them the best imaginable adaptations to life as it is. And uh, most people, uh, in again, vast generalization, most people are attached to their form of life. Um, they, they live it, as Gramsci uh, put it, as a form of common sense. And within the ways of life that they live, their common sense uh, serves them. The left only matters when it engages that common sense. Um, Gramsci's great insight was that it was, there was no automatic means by which ruling elites ruled, but rather they ruled insofar as they were able to channel, shape, manage, point, um, uh, and otherwise uh, direct the common sense of a public which was not attached by matter of right to the elite, but if there was a junction point, if there was a point where what the elites wanted was what people could imagine themselves wanting, if people felt represented by the elite, if they felt, in other words, that the elites were legitimate, then the elites were permitted to rule. And that the problem for the left, as she wrote, was to find another way of articulating common sense that was more fruitful, more animating, more just, uh, and therefore pointed ahead to something more promising than the conventional ideology. The left required an understanding of that which was not the left. And the left presupposed institutions which were not the left. Again, to go back to the new left, the, the idea of the new left was not that it would be the revolutionary vanguard, God knows, or that it would be the class that would, uh, or even the embodiment of the class or representatives of the class to usher in the end of classes. The idea of the new left was that we would be a force that would engage with other forces in the society. We would not replace, you know, we would not be replacing other forces. We would be uh, galvanizing, or uh, we would be jarring, or in any case, we would be engaging other forces. I have two more points to make, and then I'll say a word about Occupy. Many historians, I think, have well established, most recently Michael Kazin, uh, in a book called uh, American Dreamers, have, uh, are, I think, conclusively demonstrated the proposition that the left in American history is a history of success in culture and failure in politics. The left has created uh, s signs, values, emblems, uh, styles, uh, and, and American culture is in many ways the culture of the left, or at least the living, the, the live edge of it. The left is not successful as a crucible of institutions. It's not successful as a, as a presence within the state. The left is in short a social organism. It is a social organism. It's not a political platform. Uh, it's not a political institution. Um, and one might deplore the fact that this is the case, and I frequently deplore it myself. But I think it has to be accepted that, um, that this is where the success of the left has been. Now, if, if one wants the left to be something else, all well and good. All well and good. But it is then incumbent upon those who wish the left to be something other than a cultural force to actually produce it. And I think it, one has to stare hard at the fact that for decades, no one has been able to produce that left, that is to say, an institution that you can point to. 
and say, this is the left. Part of the reason, I think, has to do with the curiosities of our constitutional structure, which make the two-party system, which give the two-party system a lock on our politics, and that is deplorable, but it is also, to my mind, a given. I want to say just a few words about why I think the Occupy movement is promising. Um, the Occupy movement is the first, to my reading, is the first, and if you're interested, I try to develop this with some facts in uh, my book, Occupy Nation. Um, the Occupy movement is the first movement uh, I am aware of in American history, in American history, that begins with a base of popular support. All the movements going back to the Industrial Union movement of the 1930s and continuing through the Civil Rights Movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the gay movement, all the other movements that are offspring of the 60s, all of those movements began as minority movements. This movement, begin, this movement, the Occupy movement, begins with a, a, a remarkable supermajority support for the thrust of the movement. And I think that gives it a, uh, a force, a momentum, and a set of possibilities which deserve the kind of scrutiny I can't really offer you here. But in any case, to me, that's the starting point for um, taking seriously the Occupy movement and what it opens up. The other thing that I think the Occupy movement opens up and also deserves a lot more scrutiny than I can give it here is that like the movements of the early, not only early 1960s, the Occupy movement devised or happened upon forms of action which were commensurate with its beliefs. The, the Occupy idea itself, whatever anybody meant by it initially, turned out to be an extraordinary harnessing of face-to-face -face community, the idea of the assembly, which has a kind of ghostly presence running through the history of the left, and the electronic communication form of connection and community, which have become the, the hallmark of this epoch. The, the movement, the, the Occupy movement was not the triumph of electronics, it was not the product of Facebook, but it employed that along with and in association with the desire of people to actually create communities where they could actually become a political assembly. Uh, in, the, in the spirit, actually, of the least well understood feature of the First Amendment, the right of the people peaceably to assemble, to petition their government uh, for redress of grievances. That, to me, was ingenious. And the, the future of the Occupy movement is, I think, heavily uh, dependent upon whether it can continue to devise forms of action which belong with and attract, and, and that belong uh, that, that belong to the tradition that it itself is in, and that are attractive and in fact compelling to people who don't necessarily regard themselves as people on the left. The movement is, I think, has the life of its inventiveness. Um, I think I'll stop right there. Tom Trache, I'm a member of the Workers International League, and uh, my intro was read before, but I'll just uh, mention just a couple things. Is the uh, Workers International League is in politi political agreement with the International Marxist Tendency, and some of you might be familiar with our website, marxist.com. Uh, the IMT works in 40 plus different countries right now, particularly uh, larger uh, uh, sections in Pakistan, Italy, and Britain. So uh, it's, a, it's, very, um, uh, it's a very popular website um, in the United States. It, it gets, uh, just in the United States alone, it gets over 300,000 hits in, in the course of the year. And it's uh, got a lot of great 
articles and stuff about Marxist theory. So if you haven't checked it out, I certainly would suggest you check it out or check out our website, which is socialistappeal.org. Um, on this question of the, the question tonight about resistance, reform, and revolution, I guess the way I would look at these three terms is that I would actually see them not as counterposed, not as uh, separate from each other or opposed to each other, but I, I see them actually as linked in a dialectical sense. Because if you ever study any revolution that's ever happened in the past, uh, or any big social struggle, I think a, a revolution doesn't start by people getting together in a room and say, hey, let's make a socialist revolution, let's transform society. But usually what, what happens is it's a struggle to defend something. Um, for example, we can discuss human consciousness, and we can understand that generally human consciousness tends to be quite conservative. People don't want change. People want to have, have a certain comfortable life, and they want to maintain that life. But the problem is, is that change happens to people even when they don't want it. And we're seeing that right now with the worldwide crisis of capitalism and, and, and also particularly the crisis of American capitalism, that this is forcing changes in people's lives, in millions of people's lives, and it's forcing changes for the worse. And it's these changes that pushes people, uh, attacks their standard of living, attacks their quality of life, and forces them to fight back. And it's through that resistance that that resistance, when it, when it gets propelled forward, that can turn into revolution. And also on the question of reforms, I see the reforms to me are, are historically, if you look at any reform that you, you, you know, any major reform that you want to consider, reforms are usually a byproduct of struggle, which means it's a byproduct of resistance. And, uh, and, and so I, I see the three categories not as counterposed to each other, but actually linked to each other. Now, for us, the, the key question in terms of uh, transforming things, in, ter in terms of having revolution, the key, the key agent towards that is the working class. And I would say one thing we should consider is that the working class today in the United States or internationally is at, at least uh, potentially more powerful than it's ever been. Uh, if you look, this building that we're in would not be here unless workers built this. The electricity that's on right now, the, 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 uh, the camera that's taking pictures, the microphone that's working, if, we didn't, if we, there weren't workers who were in somehow making this electricity, put up the, the lines for this electricity to get here, uh, mine the coal, send the coal by train to the power plants, burn the coal, however, if it wasn't for the workers that do that, none of this would function. The working class potentially has, the, has tremendous power in its hands, here in the United States and worldwide. And we can see, for example, in this country, uh, if you look at the, the latest economic statistics, but I mean, it's not that no, this is not that, that's something that's really recent, uh, you, you can see there's like less than 1% of the population in this country is involved in agriculture. And I would say a lot of the people who are involved in agriculture now are not independent family farmers. They're actually people who are what we would call the agricultural proletariat. They work for a wage. Some of them, of course, are very, very uh, treated very horribly and super exploited, uh, and, and most of them are, are, are in that sense. But you have a very industrialized country when you're looking at the United States, a very powerful working class, and even uh, occupations that used to be considered middle class in this country are becoming proletarianized. They're becoming, uh, they're becoming more uh, uh, like the working class. For example, believe it or not, doctors are now one of the fastest growing unions in this country because a lot of doctors, they're not having their own little private practice in their home or in their office, but they're actually working for a hospital and they're getting wages and benefits paid by that hospital. And this is a growing section of, of the labor movement. So now you start seeing proletar proletarianization of, of even doctors. So I think that ultimately in the long run strengthens the working class. So the question is, is what as, as we go through this process of capitalist crisis, as we examine uh, what's developing, how is the resistance of the working class going to grow into more of a revolutionary consciousness and into a, into a fight to transform society? And I just would like to point out a few historical examples before, we, before I cover something in, in the more recent period, that, for example, in Russia, if we want to go back to 1905, you know, people say, well, 
look at the Russian Revolution. How did that happen? Uh, was, this, was this a socialist project from the beginning? In actual fact, it was not. In, in the 1905 Russian Revolution, the first Russian Revolution, that revolution started by a priest named Father Gapon, who led the workers to see what they termed the little father, the czar, with a list of uh, grievances and a list of reforms that they would like the little father to give them, the czar to give them. And uh, of course, at that time, when the, when the priest was leading the movement, a lot of the revolutionaries, a lot of the socialists, tried to talk to the workers, but they were met with fierce resistance from the workers. The workers were quite conservative. They, you know, they, they, and, uh, they, did, they did not, they were not open at that point to revolutionary ideas and socialist ideas. Of course, they followed the priest, they went to see the czar, and they were uh, rudely interrupted by a military detachment. And of course, we know what happened. It was very violent uh, repression of that movement. Now, that quickly changed the consciousness. You saw the consciousness. It wasn't a question of like years and years of people thinking and reading. But very quickly, overnight, the consciousness changed of large sections of the working class. And that gave birth to a series of, of uh, events that led to the 1905 Russian Revolution. And then the same thing in 1917, the, the revolution in 1917, that whole process of revolution, which began in February 1917 and, and was completed in October 1917, when the workers took power in, in Russia, that that whole revolution started not as a socialist project, not as a not as a a, 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 a outgrowth of Marxist study groups or people who read Capital or whatever, but in fact, women textile workers, very exploited women textile workers, probably politically and culturally not the most political and advanced section of the working class, super exploited, but a lot of them were also mothers of soldiers who had fought in the brutal, uh, uh, murderous uh, trenches of World War One, and they. We're, we're just tired of working huge amounts of hours and then having to go on a bread line to get bread and then standing on that bread line and not being able to get bread. And that, that battle, that resistance, if you want to say, the battle over bread is what actually set in motion what began as the February part of the Russian Revolution, which led to the defeat and the, the bringing down of the Tsar. So what we see is, I think, is that resistance Will, can, can lead to, it doesn't always lead to revolution, but it can lead to revolution. But there's also another connection. What makes a resistance, what makes, what makes a strike, what makes a series of battles and protests, what links that eventually to the successful transformation of society? Well, I think leadership is also needed. We need political leadership in order to, to have that. Well, Lenin often said that there were four factors for a successful uh, socialist revolution in, in order to occur. There are three of those factors are objective factors. First, the ruling class has to be split. It has to be, uh, it has to be unable to rule in the, in the traditional way that it's, that it's ruled. When you're in that kind of situation, society begins to be in crisis. The second objective factor of revolution is when the middle layers of society start vacillating. You start seeing the middle layers, the middle classes start moving to the right, to the left, back and forth. That, that's also a sign of crisis. That's a sign where revolution can, have, can occur. A third objective factor of, of, uh, of, of revolution is when the working class starts to move. Most of the time, the working class goes to its job, lives a peaceful life, gets exploited, doesn't say anything. But there are times when the working class said, enough is enough. They fight back. The struggles start, and they start as resistance. They start usually as defensive struggles. And when the working class starts to move, to start to take things into its own hands, then you, you have the potential for revolution. But along with those three objective factors of revolution, you need a subjective factor. You need leadership, right? What is leadership? Leadership is just the ability to learn from the past, to learn the mistakes, learn, learn both the positive and the negative from all the past social struggles, and to be able to generalize from that and translate those lessons to people, to, to, to the workers at that given time so that the movement could be successful, right? Why reinvent the wheel, right? If we didn't have the wheel, should we try to reinvent it, right? If somebody knows that we can have a wheel, let's use it, right? Why redo all the mistakes in history? Let's learn from those mistakes and let's use that for the future so we don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over again. The thing is about, as human beings, we don't just, we're, it's, our history is not just genetically programmed into us so that I can just say, well, just by birth, I know all the lessons of the past. No, we have to learn that. We have to study that and learn that. And that's part of the 
the job of building a, a, a leadership, a political leadership, which our organization is, is engaged in that project. Now, let's take a look more recently. For example, the revolution in Egypt, which happened uh, last year. You saw, clearly, if you looked at what went on in, in Egypt, you, you saw the three factors that Lenin talked about. You saw the ruling class being split, you saw the middle classes uh, vacillating, and you saw at, at the decisive point, which brought down Hosni Mubarak, you saw the working class, especially the Suez Canal workers and the textile workers and some of the other sections of the working class, decisively enter into that battle to get rid of the dictator. So you had those three objective factors, and so in that sense you had a successful revolution because they did remove the dictator. But unfortunately, the working class didn't have a leadership that would examine all those past histories, which, which would be able to focus the working class on what its tasks were in order to take over society, and that leadership was not there. So as a result, the revolution in, continues in Egypt, but it's at a low. It's that the movement is being uh, thrown back to some degree, and we see that, that still the military that's basically bought and paid for by U.S. imperialism still maintains its rule in Egypt to this, to this day, and capitalism still exists in Egypt. So the, the, the masses must struggle again. The ma masses are going to have to fight again against the new rulers and the new leaders. And you can see these, these struggles are erupting from time to time. But it just that's another factor of, of struggle when we talk about resistance and revolution. It's not just a linear thing where it just goes up and gets better every day or every year. But in fact, it's a back and forth thing. There are times when the movement goes forward. There are times when the movement goes back. We also should understand that along with revolution, dialectically what is also created is counter-revolution, right? It's not just one side that's always progressing, but the negative side also gets developed in reaction to the movement as well. Now, we, we believe, for example, that the conditions that, are, that are, uh, are around in society today create the circumstances for resistance create the circumstances which will lead to a larger uh, jump in consciousness of the working class. And I wanted to use an example of that that happened here last year in the United States. Uh, let's look at the, the labor struggles in Wisconsin. I don't know if people uh, uh, have and, and studied what, what went on in Wisconsin, but it was actually some of the most exciting labor battles that have happened in uh, certainly since, the, since probably <coughs> the late 1940s in the United States. And what was very interesting is overnight again, even without political leadership, uh, you saw the teachers in Wisconsin, when they were being attacked by the governor, they automatically shut down the Madison, uh, Wisconsin school system. And the teachers shut it down, and then they also had support from the students. They gained support from the students. And then what was also interesting is as the movement took off, even firefighters and police, who were not even being attacked by that specific law that, uh, that Governor Walker had, had supported. A lot of them jumped in to support the labor movement in that particular battle. And you also saw this, the connections that people made with Egypt and Wisconsin. For example, they held up signs saying Hosni Walker, uh, uh, aligning uh, uh, um, Governor Walker with Hosni Mubarak, the dictator that fell in Egypt. And then you saw the central, uh, the, the uh, central Wisconsin Labor Council that, that, that exists around uh, Madison, they actually passed a resolution at the beginning of the struggle saying that if this law passes, we're going to organize a, a one-day general strike or, or a general strike to some extent. So you saw that tremendous amount of radicalization that took place at, at that time in the movement. And also think about it. This is, by the way, even prior to the Occupy movement. What was one of the first things that one of, one of the, the next things they did was to occupy the state capital to some extent. In, in a sense, if you think about that occupation of the state capital by going in there and staying in there, that was almost a semi-insurrectionary move. It was like the masses were already saying, we've got to get control of this thing, get control of government. But of course, in Wisconsin also, the, the, the workers, when they fought, they went into their traditional organizations, the trade unions. The leadership of the trade unions did not have a program of revolution. That was not a leadership that believes that we should uh, transform capitalism. It was a leadership that wanted to make a deal and accept concessions and uh, allow more cutbacks, etc. So as a result, that movement was de was defeated in the sense that that law was ended up uh, ended up getting uh, passed and getting accepted. And uh, and now there is a there is a movement to to uh, to uh, uh, throw Governor Walker out of office. Uh, the recall movement. But anyways, that law is still on there, and, and, and I think that that movement, if it had a different leadership, it could have, uh, it, it could have moved forward. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I um, see that my time is up, but I did want to say just a, there, I guess there's some other points I, I wanted to make, but I guess I'll have to make it 
later in the discussion. But I did want to just uh, quickly address something. I think in the quote, there's a, there's a lot of this question of despair. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I don't think we should be in despair. I don't think, you know, I, I think if we understand the power of the working class to transform things, when it becomes conscious, it's not conscious yet, but it, once, once it becomes conscious, once, we have, once it has a leisure, we understand the power of the working class and the weakness, ultimately, of the ruling class. I think we, we have no reason to despair. And the crisis of capitalism, the serious crisis of capitalism, will create change in and of itself. Now, that's not all we need. We do also have to be part of that, and we have to intervene in the movement. But that in and of itself will create change in the circumstances. It is changing the circumstances. It will create more change in the circumstances. You can pick up the New York Times every single day in the recent period, and you see something new about the crisis of European capitalism. And the crisis of European capitalism is very serious. And it will also affect American capitalism, which itself is old and decrepit. You know, and, and I could go into that uh, uh, more in detail. So I'm not in despair. I, I think Marxism is correct. Even if our movement has been thrown back, even if we're small today, the ideas that are correct will gain more and more influence in the future. And we have, a, in a past paper, we had this title, Marx is Right. And the basis of this article was not what we were saying about Marx being right, but there are a lot of bourgeois commentators in the bourgeois press, the serious bourgeois press, that are starting to say that Marx was right on this, Marx was right on that. Of course, they're not going to be Marxists. They're not going to agree with everything he has to say. But they're starting to admit that. That's quite a change from 20 years ago in the 19, late 1980s and early 90s when you had Francis Fukuyama say it's the end of history and that Marxism is dead and Marxism is in the dustbin. Now the bourgeois are saying, well, maybe he was right on a lot of this stuff. And this is just at this stage in the crisis, which is going to get a lot worse. So I'm just going to uh, end that, uh, you know, I've got some other points I guess I'll make uh, during the discussion. But I will say this, I, I, we believe that, um, you know, Marxist theory is very important as a guide to action. But as Marx also said in his thesis on Feuerbach, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So as Hawk introduced me, uh, my name is Ross Wolf. I'm a member of the Platypus Affiliated Society. And uh, throughout late September, uh, most of October, up to the eviction, I was involved in various ways uh, in the Occupy movement, most notably in the uh, think tank, uh, but also vision and goals and several others. Almost five years have passed since Platypus hosted its first panel on the three R's, reform, revolution, and resistance. At the time, many of us were trying to come to terms with the profound sense of disorientation we felt during our involvement in the anti-war movement, which was then in a process of rapid disintegration. We hope to explore the relationship between these three categories, both to each other and to the great, greater project of human freedom, in order to determine whether an emancipatory politics was still even possible. Today, with Occupy, we stand on the precipice of what promises to herald the rebirth of such a politics. Now, these questions have acquired a renewed sense of urgency in this life. Now more than ever, they demand our attention if we are to forge a way forward without repeating the, the mistakes of the past. Reform, revolution, and resistance. Each of these concepts exercises a certain hold over the popular imagination of the left. While they need not be conceived as mutually exclusive, the, the three have often sat in uneasy tension with one another over the course of the last century. The Polish Marxist Rosa Luxemburg famously counterposed the first two in her pamphlet, Reform or Revolution, written over a hundred years ago. In her view, this ultimately turned out to be a false dichotomy. Nevertheless, Luxemburg was addressing a real dilemma that had emerged along with the formation of the Second International and the development of mass working class politics in the late 19th century. Even if she was able to conclude that reforms could could be pursued within the framework of a revolutionary program, that is, without falling into reformism. This was by no means an obvious position to take. Still less should we consider the matter done and settled with respect to our current context, simply because a great figure like Luxembourg dealt with it in her own day. We do not have the luxury of resting on the accomplishments or insights of past thinkers. It is unclear to, 
is, it is unclear whether the solution at which she arrived then holds true any longer. History can help us understand the momentum of the present, carried over from the past, as well as possible futures towards which it might be tending. But it offers no prefabricated formulae for interpreting our moment, no ready-made guides to action. Neither can, can the difficulty of relating these three concepts, reform, revolution, or resistance, be avoided by invoking the commonplace of a diversity of tactics. Each of these refers to an overarching strategy for achieving emancipation, and thus cannot be reduced to mere tactics. With resistance, it is uncertain if this activity even attains to the level of a con conscious strategy, much less tactics. In Foucault's Metaphysics of Power, resistance is an unconscious, automatic, and reflexive response to power relations wherever they exist. Where there is power, there is resistance, claims Foucault. As a statement, however, this says nothing of the world as it ought to be or how such a world might be brought into existence. At most, it only describes a fact of being. But perhaps this all, all this already assumes too much. The more fundamental question that presently confronts us is the following. What do reform, revolution, and resistance even mean today? In their modern usage, each of these concepts arose historically in connection with concrete processes and events. These are hardly perennial categories reaching all the way back to the dawn of man. Indeed, the oldest among them is only as old as the left itself. A review of the contexts in which these concepts crystallize may help clarify their bearing on the present. Not that history has the final word on what this or that term really signifies. Tracing the origins of the concepts of modern usage should not be thought of as a way to recover its authentic meaning. However, if a substantial revision has taken place in the conceptualization of reform, revolution, or resistance, we should at least be honest about this departure. This is especially true with the category of revolution, which has undergone the most significant renovation within the discourse of Occupy. For if reform was the most problematic figure of thought for Luxembourg in 1900, and resistance for Platypus five years ago, then the most pressing concept in need of clarification for the left today is revolution. If former conceptions of revolution proved to be inadequate or unrealistic, this does not mean that we are forbidding from using the word, of course. But we should make, be clear about the break, so as to not fool ourselves that we are somehow remaining loyal to the good old cause. Of the three terms presently on, under investigation, resistance is of the most recent vintage, at least to the extent that it has been conceptualized and self-consciously used on the left. A couple of preliminary remarks may help to focus the discussion. First, as Stephen Duncan pointed out a few years ago, the concept of resistance is inherently conservative. It indicates the ability of something to maintain itself, that is, to conserve or preserve its present state of existence, against outside influences that would otherwise change it. Resistance signifies not only defiance, but also intransigence. It, it thus appears to be politically ambivalent. It depends on what is being conserved and what is being resisted. To illustrate this ambivalence, in order to highlight its potentially ultra-reactionary character, one needs only look to Resistance Records, a white power label founded in 1999. Secondly, beyond its conceptual dimension, the language of resistance is linked to conservatism at an historical level as well. Against the rationalism and excesses of the French Revolution, the British statesman and arch-conservative Edmund Burke praised England for its resistance to radical projects of political modernization. And this is a quote from Burke. Thanks to our sullen resistance to innovation, thanks to our cold sluggishness, the cold sluggishness of our national character, we still bear the stamp of our forefathers. We are not the converts of Rousseau. We are not the disciples of Voltaire. Helvetius has made no progress amongst us. We fear God. We look up with awe to kings, with affection to parliaments, with duty to magistrates, with reverence to priests, and with respect to nobility. Only in the 20th century did resistance come to be associated with leftist politics by virtue of a twofold historical development. First, it was ennobled through movements of opposition by colonial peoples and resisting imperial subjugation. It was romanticized yet further through the experience of La Resistance in Vichy, France, as a number of its most prominent heroes and martyrs belonged to the communist movement. In the hands of postmodern and postcolonial theory, resistance received the Academy's authoritative stamp of approval as the standard mode of de dissent under late capitalism. Down at Liberty Square last fall, I'd regularly see signs that read, in a sort of perverse Cartesianism, 
I resist, therefore I exist. <laughs> Such is the genealogy of, of resistance on the left. In its modern sense, reform stretches back quite a bit further. However, this should not be taken too far to the point of anachronism. One might be tempted, for example, to include the Magna Carta in the history of reforms. It should be remembered, however, that the king's concession to the feudal barony was not obtained through established legal channels, but at the tip of a sword. Though the history of successful sweeping reforms begins in Britain with the Great Reform Act of 1832, demands for reform had a fairly lengthy prehistory. Originally, the meaning of reform in the strict sense was specifically related to matters of enfranchisement or extension of the electorate. The first proposal for universal male suffrage was advanced by John Wilkes in 1776, largely as a reaction to the American War of Independence. Public clamoring for reform rapidly accelerated in the aftermath of the French Revolution of 1789, however. Even in the wake of Waterloo, that is, the defeat, the final defeat of the French Revolution, the great utilitarian philosopher Bentham posed the same disjunction as Luxembourg 80 years later would, would propose, albeit in an extremely uh, different register. And this is what uh, Bentham wrote. The country is already on the very brink. Reform or convulsion, such as the alternative. The Reform Bill of 1832 granted broader voting rights to the Br British population, at least in principle. Popular pressure for reforms came in large part from the nascent labor movement, which once again was made to contend with the quote-unquote resistance of conservative legislators. Despite its successful passage, the numerous deficiencies and compromises in the legislation, along with the suppression of more radical measures, led many to believe that the reforms did not go far enough. The Chartist movement grew out of this overwhelming sense of dissatisfaction. However, immediately following the enactment of the 1832 Reform Bill, the foundational act in the history of modern reform, the, the terrain on which the battle for reforms was waged shifted, however. Reforms no longer centered exclusively exclusively on the issue of suffrage. Fresh on its heels came the Factory Act of 1833. Over the course of the next 30 years, the working class in Britain fought for the institution of regular limits to the working day, a struggle rivetingly described by Marx. Within the context of international social democracy, the struggle for reform was not conceived as separable from the goal of revolution until the end of the 19th century. The crisis of second international Marxism that occurred in the revisionist debate of the 1890s was itself symptomatic of, the success, of its success in building a mass movement. In other words, Bernstein's contention that the proletariat could realize its emancipation through a progression of social reforms had itself been precipitated by the movement's strength in achieving parliamentary representation. However, the gains made through social reforms by the convergence of European social democracy, which drifted gradually rightward following 1917, and liberalism, drifting leftward in its <coughs> teens form after 1933, are today deteriorating under cutbacks. The faint murmurs heard early on, which called for the reinstatement of Glass Steagall, or the creation of a Jobs for All program, have all but subsided in the Occupy movement. Placards have since appeared in the Occupy protests stating that capitalism cannot be reformed. True enough. But what would reform even look like now that the left is everywhere in retreat? Are the austerity measures in Europe, for example, reforms? Bank bailouts and deregulation? Rescinded pensions and mass layoffs? If today the question of reform is once again entered into crisis, this is because the concept of revolution has lost its self-evidence. Luxembourg's rejoinder to Bernstein steadfastly asserted that the conquest of political power has been the aim of all rising classes. And while Trotsky could categorically claim in 1924 without hesitating, that by revolutionary strategy, we understand the art of conquest, that is, the seizure of power. It is not at all clear to us that this is still the case. The Occupy movement has, by contrast, by and large followed the strategy formulated by the Marxian economist John Holloway in 2002, in light of the Zapatista movement, to change the world without taking power. The subtitle to Holloway's book of the same title says it all, The Meaning of Revolution Today. As with resistance and reform, the modern concept of revolution arose historically. It should not be elevated into a trans-historical principle simply by virtue of the venerable status it enjoys within leftist political discourse. As suggested earlier, revolution was born alongside the left itself as its conceptual twin. William Sewell has perhaps contributed the most to, under to understanding this historical dimension of revolution. And this is a quote from Sewell. 
We are by now used to the notion that revolutions are radical transformations in political systems imposed by violent uprisings of the people. We therefore don't see the extraordinary novelty of the claim in the claim that the taking of the Bastille was an act of revolution. Prior to the summer of 1789, the word revolution did not carry the implication of a change of political regime achieved by popular violence. In ordinary parlance, the, up the uprising or mutiny of July 14th could be designated by contemporaries as a revolution, but this was not because it was a self-conscious attempt by the people to impose its will by force on the sovereign. For Sewell, the concept of revolution, at least in its modern meaning, designates a momentous and irrevocable event. This is, a, this is quoting him. Events should be conceived of as sequences of, of occurrences that result in transformations of structures. Such sequences begin with a rupture and durably transform previous structures and practices. Any revolution worthy of the name would thus seem to involve a radical discontinuity with the past, a sort of compressed temporality. Lenin is said to have once quipped that there are decades when no, where nothing happens. There are weeks when decades happen. Revolution in this model would, th would thus necessarily seem to hinge upon certain decisive moments, turning points, breakthroughs, tipping points, points of no return, starts and fits. Moments after which nothing was ever the same, after which there was no going back. Removing these moments from a revolution would mean reducing it to the vague notion of a slow, even, gradual change, with an absence of leaps and storms. Of course, a revolution cannot be accomplished all at once in one fell swoop. At a certain level, there must be a dialectic between process and event involved in any truly revolutionary transformation. The international revolution, Trotsky always reminded, constitutes a permanent process despite temporary declines and ebbs. Nevertheless, Trotsky was always sure to stress the unevenness of this process. Historical processes are far from consisting in a steady accumulation and continual improvement of that which exists. History has its transitions of quantity into quality, its crises, leaps, and backward lapses. Certainly some continuity with the world before the revolution will remain, but there will be important discontinuities as well. The understanding of re revolution just sketched can be usefully contrasted, however, with that of David Graeber, whose thought has undeniably served as one that occupies greatest sources of inspiration. Graeber provides the clearest expression of revolution as a kind of continuous, never-ending process unpunctuated by events. Accordingly, he rejects the notion of history as, qualitatively dis as marked by qualitatively distinct epochs. He writes, there has been no one fundamental break in human history. No one can deny that there have been massive quantitative changes, the amount of energy consumed, the speed at which humans can travel, the number of books produced and read, but these quantitative changes do not necessarily imply a change in quality. We are not living in a fundamentally sort of di different sort of society than has ever existed before. We are not in a fun living in a fundamentally different sort of time. In Graeber's opinion, the mistake underlying the, these conceptions of revolution as rupture consists in the Lukacian assumption that abstractions like capitalism or society exist as real totalities. He writes, the habit of thought which defines society is a totalizing system tends to lead almost inevitably to a view of revolutions as cataclysmic ruptures. In place of this more traditional version of what revolution may look like, Graeber instead advocates a prefigurative model of creating a microcosm of what the society would, one would want to live in. The, this notion is not wholly without precedent. Echoes can still be heard here of the old motto from the 1905 IWW preamble, which prescribes forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. Among the Occupy movement's more militant sections, the French pamphlet The Coming Insurrection still holds some weight. With its paramilitary pose and radical chic, its knowing matter-of-factness, the rhetoric of this mini-manifesto remains fashionable in some circles. <coughs> the book refrains from glamorizing violence as such, but much of its appeal clearly comes from its literal call to arms. Take up arms, it advises. There is no such thing as a peaceful insurrection. Weapons are necessary. Still, there are traces of the old revolutionary concept of irreversibility in their notion of insurrection. Nevertheless, the imagination of the coming insurrection is for the most part limited to the experience of the 2005 riots in, in the Paris Banlieues, scattered local affairs. World revolution is nowhere to be found in its pages. It should be emphasized that, this, that these concepts of revolution depart not only from most of those passed down by Marxist theory through the ages, but also from the majority of anarchist ideas concerning revolution prior to 1968. 
Giants of revolutionary anarchism like Bakunin, Nechayev, and Malatesta each adhered to the idea of a massive sudden uprising, a simultaneous break with the past taking place on a worldwide scale. Some, like Paul Brousset and Johann Most, advocated the propaganda of the deed, acts of spectacular terrorism, hoping to incite the masses to spontaneous action. Kropotkin also understood revolution as, quote, synonymous with the toppling and overthrow of age-old institutions within the space of a few days, with violent demolition of established forms of property, with the destruction of class, with the rapid change of received thinking on morality. One would be hard-pressed to find any revolutionary program coming out of Occupy with such ambitious scope or intensity. Such departures from the way revolution was previously understood should not be thought unacceptable, of course. Trying to hold anyone, let alone an anarchist, to the authority of past thinkers would be an exercise in futility. The real question, it seems to me, is the following. What does it say about our political moment that such past conceptions of revolution seem so outlandish, impossible, and unthinkable to us today? Were yesterday's notorious revolutionaries simply deluded, mistaken, or misguided, perhaps? Or is it rather that we stand on political ground that is substantially regressed from the position it held a century ago? That's it. So I, I have a couple just quick uh, things I'd like to uh, ask the panelists here. Um, maybe just to... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Ross, uh, maybe just begin with you because you were the most recent um, speaker here. Um, it's interesting. I mean, you you know you ended on this note um, that that for us revolution is sort of an unthinkable possibility today. But I think Tom, for example, would disagree insofar as you know, Tom is saying that the the objective conditions are here um, and that it's the subjective that's missing. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Tom. <coughs> Um, but it's interesting, I mean, when you think of revolution, um, Ross, the, the idea of kind of pulling apart reform and revolution to maybe say that revolution is the more problematic concept today is kind of an interesting thing to do because um, insofar as uh, reform in the modern sense of the word, meaning an incremental kind of change to the world as it already exists, um, reform is only possible uh, with the bourgeois revolutions, right? It's only possible after uh, uh, really the beginning of modernity, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, to even think about what a reform is, because there's, there's no such thing as reform in feudal society. It's just, there's no concept. Um, so it's interesting to pull them apart. I'd, I'd like to see if you could speak to that uh, for a minute, Ross. Um, uh, and then uh, for Tom and for Todd, um, uh, Todd, you brought up this, this question of the, the French resistance as a sort of uh, instance in which resistance as a category is used in a kind of progressive way. And Tom, I know you had actually mentioned it to me when we had spoken a few weeks back. You brought this up as a kind of uh, instance. Um, but it's interesting um, because the, the French resistance in some ways um, makes more sense as resistance than um, resistance to capitalism does insofar as um, uh, uh, early 20th century Marxism, I would say, uh, Lenin in particular, Bolshevism, um, considers the uh, realization of socialism as a kind of the transcendence of capitalism, or in, in a way it's full realization, right? Um, not the destruction of capital, but really it's, 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 it's transcendence and, and the full flowering of capitalism. Um, but it's not clear to me that fascism can be transcended or fulfilled, right? So it's possible that um, the possibility of fascism could have been transcended or beaten back with the, um, the realization of the German Revolution, but insofar as it failed, the German Revolution fails, and then we have the development of fascism. So resistance to fascism makes sense insofar as you can't, I, don't, I, I would offer, uh, fulfill or transcend fascism in the way that you can fulfill or transcend capitalism, uh, uh, which, which would be I would argue socialism ultimately. Um, I, that's a, quite a bit. That's all I'm really going to say. I'm going to open up to the audience after these questions are answered. Um, however, you guys want to go ahead uh, and. Well, I'll say a couple things. First, um, just to take up this question of 
the resistance in France, um, we should understand what were they resisting when we talk about fascism. Fascism was a form of capitalism, right? German capitalism was in a severe crisis. Italian capitalism was in a severe crisis. The, the, uh, at a certain point, the industrialists used the lumpen elements and the middle class elements and some of the backward workers. They created these fascist organizations like the Nazis in Germany or the fascists in Italy, and they took power. And eventually they established you know, these horrible military police states. And by the way, how the Germans took over France, let's, let's be clear, what happened was the French bourgeoisie was more afraid of the working class in France coming to power than they were of the Germans taking over France. So that's what, you know, and, and the, uh, in France, the capitalists for the most part were collaborations. Remember, Vichy was a, was a part of, a, was basically an allied government in, in part of France that was allied with the Nazis. So the resistance against the Nazis and against fascism was also ultimately a, a, a potentially a resistance against capitalism. The Communist Party, which was the main leader of the resistance, uh, when it came, when it, when uh, when the war ended, if they had had a, a revolutionary policy, unfortunately, this would go into discussion of Stalinism. They were dominated by the pro-Moscow Stalinist Communist Party. But because of that, the the French working class could have taken power in France at the end of World War II. They absolutely could have, and they would have had tremendous uh, propaganda ability among the American troops who couldn't wait to get out of the military at the end of World War II. There were huge movements. Probably a lot of people don't know, but there were huge movements uh, among the American troops in Europe. And, and, and elsewhere who wanted to go home. They wanted to get out and demobilize the, uh, the forces. But um, the, the French Communist Party, if it had been a genuine Marxist party, could have led the working class to take power in France at that time. By the way, the main reason the Allies invaded uh, France uh, was because if they didn't do that, they wouldn't have met the Russian, the Red Army on the Albi River in, in Germany. They would have met the R Red Army at the English Channel because there, it was the Soviet Union basically that, that defeated the Nazis and the resistance from the different countries, the, the underground resistance, that's what really defeated the Nazis. It wasn't uh, U.S. imperialism, British imperialism. Um, on this question of uh, the question of reform and revolution, again, I would say this, the what the fight for reforms is a byproduct of struggle. But the question is, is I'm, I'm for reforms. I'm against reformism, which is a different you know, category of thought. Reformism is basing itself on the reality of capitalism, accepting capitalism, not wanting to transform capitalism into a socialist society. So it accepts the limits of capitalism. So when you're in a period of a post-World War II boom, like you know, World War II wiped out 60 million people and destroyed Europe and destroyed Asia. So that created a tremendous boom for American capitalism because all our factories were intact, right? So the U.S. steel industry, auto industry, hey, that was great. Rubber industry, fantastic, right? So you had this huge post-World War II boom of capitalism from 1945 till around 74, 75 recession. During that post-war boom, as a byproduct of struggles, of labor struggles, etc., you could get reforms. Now we're in a different period of capitalism. We're returning to the period that we saw in the 1930s, an extended crisis of capitalism, worldwide and also American capitalism. Therefore, they don't have the money, uh, as they see it, to provide reforms. It's going to take only the most massive struggles to fight for any kind of reforms. And in fact, I believe the struggle for reforms will be the struggle for revolution. Um, and I think um, if you... You, you know, we have a book over there uh, that has Trotsky's transitional program. If you look at the method of Trotsky in the transitional program, he advocates that, that we, can, we can use the struggle for reform and even defensive struggles as part of a way of educating the working class to understanding that it must transform society, it must take power to transform things. Look at what's going on. Just yesterday, they're talking about cutting Social Security in the United States. It used to be, right, 10, 20, 30 years ago. That was, they call that the third rail in American politics. You could never talk about cutting Social Security. Now, both parties, Democrats and Republicans, are, are, are talking about cutting Social Security and that it's going to have to be cut. There's no reforms to give within the context of, crisis, of the crisis of capitalism. That's why there's a crisis of reformism. That's why there's a crisis of, you know, uh, of, of, that, of that political tendency. Um, yeah, if I could pick up on that point, and I'll return to the question that you posed um, about reform and revolution. I think with the French resistance, it's, I mean, on the surface of it, you know, it's obviously a, a, a very noble movement in, in resistance to uh, the, the Nazi uh, collaborationist elements of uh, the Vichy regime. Um, but 
I mean, beneath that sort of like united front, the sort of Stalinist pop frontism that, that animated a lot of the uh, anti-Nazi politics of the resistance, um, there was collaboration against the Nazis with elements of French society like monarchists, uh, who opposed not only, not only the Nazis, but also the Third Republic. Um, and so they were looking for a return to some sort of uh, dynastic uh, rule there. In terms of, uh, I mean, I agree with you that the uh, it was it was you know the Red Army you know it, tremendous losses to it you know human losses that defeated ultimately uh, Third Reich. Um, I'm I'm not sure like it's ambiguous when when you say that when you mention that um, we're returning to something like an extended crisis of capitalism, uh, a la the 1930s. I think that that moment, in terms of like objective, you know, sort of like extreme conditions of poverty and financial crisis, they're ambivalent, right? I mean, instead of producing a sort of socialist revolution, what it, what came out of the 1930s was fascism on the one hand and Keynesianism on the other, and both of these, even if they were objectively reliant upon the structures of capitalism, they subjectively conceived of themselves as offering a third way between capitalism and communism. Um, the Nazis, of course, associated both capitalism and communism in a sort of weird doublespeak as both Jewish um, and proposed this sort of like, you know, this sort of individualism of the leader figure along with the sort of collectivism of the people as a sort of resolution of this sort of divide between the individual and society. Uh, Keynesianism was an attempt transparently to save capitalism from itself. Um, he wrote of it as, uh, Keynes wrote of it as a sort of like anti-Marxian socialism. Um, when it comes to the question of reforms uh, versus revolution today, um, what's strange is that, I mean, the left has been put in a position where, like, the conservatism of Keynesianism is no, like, is no longer, is no longer apparent to us today. In fact, what the left has been forced into largely, is a defense of reforms that were passed 60 years ago. It's not fighting for new reforms, necessarily. It's, it's struggling, it's desperately struggling to maintain those that have already been passed. Without the question of, without a sort of, you know, without the conception of revolution as a sort of fundamental break, a break in the sense of both, you know, a continuity with the past realizing itself, but leading to something something substantially new, qualitatively new. The, the question of reforms within the context of the, of the kind of constitutional amendment, the kind of like transformational institutional amendments cannot, cannot really be meaningfully posed. Uh, reforms today, I mean, it's unclear as I, as I mentioned, like reforms today seem to be in the form of dismantling uh, reforms of the past, not, not further reforms. Uh, improving social life. Let me just say something brief. Uh, there are times, and this is one of them, when I think we do need a revolution, and it needs to be conceptual. Um, and the conceptual revolution I have in mind is disposing of <clears throat> universal claims about this, about the meaning of revolution and about the, the totalizing force of capitalism. There is no revolution as a sort of eternal Hegelian lodestone. There is no working class as a subject of history. And capitalism is not all of a piece. When we oppose capitalism, what is it that we oppose? Private property, markets, the arrogation of power to small groups of capitalists. Is, capital, is private property itself the problem? I, I don't, this is not the occasion to answer these questions. But I feel that the vocabulary retards us. Um, 
the notion that there is a template that, uh, that, that is preordained to formulate, to, to drive us to formulate the current incarnation of the revolution, capital T, capital R, I think is, a, is an exercise in nostalgia. Um, there is no revolution. There is no working class. We have situations. We exist in concrete situations. I think it's the concrete situations that we should be talking about. Okay, so um, probably the best way to do this is to uh, maybe do two at a time. I guess I see three now. Um, but let me go Chris and then Richard. Can you guys maybe speak into the mic um, over here? Just no, because? it's no? fine. Is it okay? Are you going to hear it? Okay, all right. Just speak loudly, please. <laughs> I have a question for Todd and for Tom. Uh, Todd, you talked about resistance as a kind of way of living, and that then later on is the way in which you define left, uh, and how you thought, first you said resistance may not necessarily be adequate means for trying to transform society today, and then you talked about the left as an organism, and all these uh, different, and how it's not a program, how it's not a set of doctrines, or any institutions. But to me, the way in which you describe the left sounds very similar to describing uh, um, resistance as the way of living, as like almost like living like a lifestyle. So I was wondering if you could try to expand on that. How do you see the two definitions different? Um, because to me, the way I understood it was the same. Uh, for Tom, um, you talked about uh, you know Lenin's four dictums in order to have uh, spark a revolutionary moment. The fourth being the most uh, important, where the working class has the right kind of subjectivity to make revolution happen. Well, and, and then you briefly mentioned how that right now it might be a really prime time uh, because the working class is increasing, you know, they're all over the globe. Uh, but um, Lenin, as you know, distinguished the difference between trade union consciousness and social democratic consciousness. So by virtue of just being part of the working class doesn't necessarily mean that the struggles that the working class plays out would necessarily be revolutionary per se. In fact, they could be counter-revolutionary or they could just perpetuate the status quo unconsciously. So I was wondering if you could uh, describe a little bit more of what you mean by the subjective factor of the working class in relation to today being a, a prime moment for revolutionary consciousness. What I, what I wanted to say about resistance is that I don't think it is an intellectual foundation. I think it is a moral stance in the world, which is admirable, but insufficient. Um, there is no, you know, from the Hegelian tradition, there's a notion of a determinate negation. Okay? Socialism is the determinate negation of capitalism. I don't think that notion is helpful. Um, what I do think is that we confront a, a form of capitalism which is demented, unstable, unjust, disturbing, and in need of transformation. And we ought to get on to talking about concrete ways to address a capitalist system. For example, we have, there, there exists a, 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 an, an apparatus which can be enormously, which is enormously productive. There are, there, there are forms of, you know, of machinery, and forms of the organization of machinery which have the capacity to actually improve life. And the, the question that interests me is not whether we should be resisting capitalism. The question that interests me is what would be a way in which the people who actually produce this stuff could actually lay hands on the process and make it run in a more decent and humane fashion? That to me is the question of the to speak of either resistance or revolution as a solution just strikes me as an evasion of a concrete problem. A concrete problem that should be addressed. Uh, okay. So, in, uh, with, when I was talking about Lenin's four factors of revolution, the question, it's not even that the subjective factor is necessarily the most important factor, but that's usually the missing factor. You know, because like for example, in Tunisia, 
I mean, I, I guess some people may challenge whether a revolution happened in Tunisia. There was, to me, a revolution in Tunisia last year, right? It's a political revolution, it wasn't a social revolution. They didn't socially transform society, but there was a revolution, they brought a dictator down. Same thing in Egypt, right? Now the question is, if there had been a subjective factor, if there had been a mass leadership of the working class, meaning that you have uh, uh, people who are active, who've studied you know, Marxist theory and have studied history and have learned from that history, and are able to translate to the masses a way out, a way of, a way of um, challenging the state, transforming, getting rid of the old state, building a new state, taking over the mass means of production, taking over the, 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 the when, we, when I talk about private property, I'm not talking about your coat or your, shoe or your shirt, what I'm talking about is the means of production of the, the imperialist multinational corporations, the super wealthy, and you, if you take that into collective ownership, then you can start to, to have a democratic society that's where you have democratic planning instituted. And if you have that kind of subjective factor there, then that could be the difference between uh, success and failure. And, and I, I think you saw that in Tunisia, I think you see, see that in Egypt. You might even to some ar ar argue that to some extent in Greece it's the same thing. If, there, if you look at the struggles that have been going on in Greece, there have been plenty of general strikes, there have been occupations of the squares, which by the way, the Occupy Wall Street movement was inspired by the Tahir Square occupation in Egypt, right? And it's the same thing in Greece, they did the same thing in Siktagma Square, right? So you saw huge occupation, huge general strikes, even, even elements of insurrectionary general strikes in Greece, but they don't have a leadership there that, 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 can, that can transform the consciousness, lead the consciousness to the point of what the tasks are the working class needs to do to take power. Now, um, you know, Lenin, uh, when he talked about the question of the working class achieving trade union consciousness, I, we should point out that Lenin later corrected himself on that. You know, there, throughout history, through through the conditions of capitalism, the conditions of capitalism don't at every moment create a working class consciousness where the working class fights for itself. You know, Marx says, for, for when the working class is not conscious of itself as a class, it's just raw material for exploitation, and that exists for most of the time. But, but eventually the conditions create times where the working class is forced to struggle, then struggles, and learns through that struggle, and you see a growth in consciousness. The first level of consciousness, you could say to some extent, is trade union consciousness, but the working class historically has shown that it goes beyond that. For example, in most advanced industrial countries, over time, the working class has created its own political party, except in the United States. That's the only exception right now. In Canada, the labor movement created the NDP, that's the party of the working class. In Britain, they created the Labour Party. In France, they have the Socialist Party and the Communist Party, or mass political parties, mass uh, political leadership. In Germany, you have the Linke. You know, you, you can go country after country. The working class learns through that experience. And it, and and, um, and but but the question is, is that's not enough. In order for that successful transformation to hap happen, you need people. You need a, a section of the class that has to study history, learn from history, and translate that into practical uh, um, uh, programs and practical uh, tactics that are, that are needed in order to take power. And it's just like, for example, look, if I have a problem with my teeth, I want to go to a dentist, I want, to, I want someone who's studied dentistry, right? I don't want to just uh, uh, go to someone off the street and say, can you fix my tooth or fix my problem? You need people who have studied these problems and learn from the past so that, so, that this, so that the mistakes from the past can be translated so that we don't do the same thing. Like, you know, if you want to talk about Allende or whatever, the Venezuelan revolution we could talk about. You know, uh, you know there's a lo lot of different points, but there's a problem. Yes. <laughs> if, if I can just briefly respond to a couple of the remarks that were made before proceeding to Richard's question. It strikes me as kind of odd, uh, because we're um, that this sort of conceptual revolution that you're calling for is a sort of abandonment of the notion of revolution itself. And, I mean, it may be historically justified at this point um, that revolution no longer seems possible. However, I mean, having studied history, I know that at one point there were, uh, there were moments in the past where revolution seemed a very palpable, immediate possibility, where crisis and a sort of subjective uh, mass working class movement existed in such force that transcending capitalist society wasn't, wasn't just a sort of pipe dream, but actually something that could be at least discussed, you know, in speculative terms. Um, but at the same time, like, I think that we need to be honest about the sort of, the sort of, the, the conditions of consciousness in our present moment. 
Marx uh, once wrote that uh, the working class is either revolutionary or it is nothing. And I think at this point in history, I think that we have to admit that, at least for, for now, for the moment, the working class is nothing. As you said, it's just exploitable raw material. But it's because the working class is potentially everything that, I mean, that, that it, the sort of like only hope for true social transformation rests ultimately in its ability to, to subjectively master the forces of the past that the capitalism has unleashed into history and master history rather than just be mastered by history and ruled by dead labor. And I think actually the, the point that you mentioned about like making the instruments of capitalism, the vast industrial apparatus serve the ends of humanity, I actually don't see how that would be any different from achieving revolution. The idea of, of capitalism is that is that it's alienated, that, that social labor serves an, a, a force, an entity outside of society itself, capital. All of socialized production is for the sake of valorizing, capitalizing upon dead labor, dead value. Um, if it was actually directed towards fulfilling human needs, it would no longer be capitalism. It would be socialism. I mean, what that would require is another question. Uh, just before you start, maybe I can get uh, you to ask and then you can ask your question and then so we can have two in a row and then... Uh, uh, sure. To, to begin with Professor Gitlin, I mean, you spoke about the, the, the huge popularity of Occupy. <coughs> and that's true. I mean, that, I think that's quite obvious that Occupy has been very popular in the general public. But the cynical response to that, it was popular because it's a blank slate on which people can project whatever they want. I mean, you have people there you know, who are supporters of Ron Paul, you've got anarchists, you've got Trotskyists, you've got social democrats, you've got everything. So one of the things I keep hearing from people, you know, people who like Occupy, not people who are against it, is like, oh, I like Occupy, I like the idea of it. I just wish I knew what they stood for, what they're asking for. We just sort of run up the mill sort of left liberal type people, ordinary people. So I guess that, that my sense of Occupy is that the, the popularity of Occupy and the strategy of having a movement that doesn't really clearly ask for anything means that the significance of the movement politically ne isn't necessarily that great. And there's also clearly a desire on the part of a lot of people in the left wing of the Labour Party to harness Occupy for support for the left wing of the Labour Party, which they haven't been able to do because they haven't been able to sort of come up with the usual social democratic demands, which would make it that. Um, and then for, for the, about the, the party uh, of the workers, I mean, I happen to be reading, looking at these books and works of Ted, selected works of Ted Grant. Now, one of the things that Grant was known for in the Trotskyist movement was his emphasis on working within the British Labour Party, which at one point in the 80s seemed to be quite a successful strategy with militants, although then they were essentially kicked out and the Labour Party went to the right. So I, I guess the question is, do you envision then an organization like the British Labour Party becoming an agent of revolutionary transformation? And how do you see that? Because I, it would seem to me that the historical record of parties like that becoming agents of revolutionary transformation is not all that good. And second of all, what would we do in the United States where we don't even have a British mass British Labour Party? All we have is the Democratic Party. And I, I guess sort of Ross, just this is not a question, but sort of a comment. I'm a little puzzled by your category because when I remember the discussion about about the three categories in the original discussion, what I found that people had the greatest confusion about was actually the category of reform. And it seems to me resistance is by far the oldest of the categories because resistance, not as something that's been glommed onto by the left, is something that you would find in feudal society. You would find the resistance of the serf to excessive demands from feudal lord. It's the categories of reform and revolution that d depend upon a modern political concept of the left, whereas resistance doesn't depend on any concept of the left whatsoever. And I, I also would problematize specifically the history of the French resistance. And I would note that particularly at the time, many Trotskyists had a lot of criticisms. And the whole history of resistance against Nazism 
bodies the Nazism needed to be resisted was tied into the politics of nationalism throughout Europe. And there were many more problematic examples than this one. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, this has been a terrific panel so far. Thank you very much uh, for all your insights. Um, I had a question, a lot of talk right now about learning from history, and uh, Dr. Gitlin, you mentioned there wasn't really a historic precedent for the Occupy movement, and not just because I'm PhD student in history, but I'm just curious particularly that I think there is a precedent in the 1820s and 30s, that of the sort of Jacksonian Democrats, and I don't just bring this up this is sort of fact check, but I do think that if we are to learn from history, there is a lot of very useful bearing that that period can have for us. What I find most interesting about that period is it's so an alliance between working class urban laborers and rural southern agricultural workers, and the rhetoric of, pop, of democracy on the one hand, and that of this kind of low-level populism on the other. And right now we see both of those elements, I find, except they're disaggregated from each other, where you see a lot of the rhetoric of democracy coming from the Occupy movement, and a lot of this sort of <coughs> petty bourgeois you know, populism coming from the right, particularly through the Tea Party. And in the case of the Jacksonian Democrats, you actually saw an alliance between these two groups, as crazy as it sounds, and they were able to create an entire political party that was able to be pretty successful for a while. The, they made a lot of compromises doing that most dramatically over slavery. But they were able to make a lot of reforms and some would say prevent corporate capitalism in its larger sense from taking over many levels of government. So I'm wondering if we were to try applying that today, I'm not sure what you think of this, but is it useful, is it necessary, is it possible to consider alliances between what we would consider leftist groups and some of the populist groups on the right. Is that conceivable? Do you think that could get us anywhere? What would that look like? I'm just throwing that out of speculation. Yeah, if you guys want to go ahead. Are we piling up questions and waiting? Or I think uh, maybe sure. two at once, just because they're sort of involved. Both of those are pretty involved, and then I'll take another couple. So whenever you guys want to. I have a very brief response to Richard's uh, point. Um, I would agree that resistance is probably the oldest uh, category as a sort of historical just fact, like a physical fact of, of everyday life. Um, in terms of its conceptualization, and specifically, I, I did say, in terms of its history as a concept on the left, it's more, re it's more recent than, say, revolution, which I would say is the oldest, than reforms which, which tend to tail or, you know, come after substantial revolutions. Then resistance really as a sort of, uh, I would say that resistance as the sort of like standard mode of dissent today is actually symptomatic of feelings of powerlessness in terms of resisting a force that otherwise seems to overwhelm us, against which we have no pro actual real sense of overcoming and mastering. Okay, um, let me uh, take up the question. Of, first of all, the question of the Labor Party in the United States. It's our perspective that over the next period, um, you can see definitely economic and social instability is on increase in the United States overall. Again, it's not a line, it's not a linear thing, it's a dialectical thing, up and down. But definitely that's on the increase. The, uh, the, the standard of living is being driven down and it's going to be driven down a lot more. We're not at the worst part, we're at the, just the beginning of that. Um, and as a result, that's going to force the working class, which I believe does exist, um, and, uh, it's going to force the working class to fight back. And when it fights back, it's also going to go into the trade unions. And at some stages, there are going to be oppositions forming against the present trade union leadership. Because for the most part, the vast majority of the American trade union leadership, this is the real problem of the left. You want to talk about the left of the United States? This is the real problem. The trade union leadership is pro-capitalist. They accept capitalism. We could go into a whole reason of the post World War II uh, boom and the McCarthy period and all that, but that's the, the American trade union leadership is like that. There's going to be a growing opposition to them, and there'll be a much more radical, eventually, labor movement that's formed. When, when that happens, I think one of the outgrowths of that, one of the byproducts, is going to be a movement for a labor party in this country. When there is a labor party in this country, it will not be like the British Labor Party is today. It will be a very radical party, in my opinion, a very revolutionary. Uh, party. There will be lots of different wings. I'm sure there will be a reformist wing, but it will be a, a very radical wing. The reason I say that 
is because if the trade union leadership today, if they set up a labor party, then they would set up a very much a strongly top-down reformist labor party. But they're not interested in doing that. Their ties to the Democratic Party, their ties to you know to those elements are too strong, and they 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 are they are basically you know channeling the pressure from the ruling class down to into the ranks of the, of the labor movement. So they will fight to the end against developing a labor party. It's only going to be through mass struggles, mass strikes, mass movements to organize the unorganized. Then you will see eventually a big movement towards a labor party. And I think anybody on the left genuinely would be part of that movement to fight for labor. We're a small force now, but we constantly raise that idea. I constantly raise the idea in my union and among coworkers. You, by the way, the idea of a labor party is very popular among the ranks and file. It's not popular among the trade union leadership, whose ties to the Democratic Party are very close. But it is actually quite popular with the rank and file. That doesn't mean they're about to do something to, to bring that into about. But, but that, that's the case. Now, on the question of the British Labour Party, um, you know, Ted Grant, the late Ted Grant was one of, we consider one of our greatest, uh, uh, you know, theoreticians and political leaders. And, um, you know, his, his view was that, and, and he said, is, is by looking at history, when the working class struggles, they go to their traditional organizations, right? They need something, they need some help, they go into the unions, they go into the mass workers' parties and mass labor parties where they exist. In Britain, the Labour Party is, is the only place that, that, you know, that's the political organization of the, of the working class. Now, we, we understand that dialectically. There are periods when, there, when there's radicalization in society and then you see a growth in the left wing of the Labour Party. There are other periods when that doesn't happen, right? And when the party moves all the way to the right. And we saw Tony Blair's project was to take the Labour Party and become, make it, try to make it like the Democratic Party. But he was unsuccessful, right? The ties with the unions are still there. So what, what you will see in the next period, at some stage, is you'll see growing radicalization, you're already seeing grow, growing radicalization in the trade unions in Britain. Eventually, that will filter into the Labour Party. It will eventually have an effect in the Labour Party, and you'll see a growth in the left of the Labour Party. At this stage, it's just in the very, very beginning stages of that, right? I think there's been some, some uh, upheaval a little bit in the London area of the Labour Party, and, uh, you know, but, but, uh, but it's at the very beginning stages. But we see that process eventually uh, occurring again. So at some stage, and, and, and now we're not saying that the Labour Party itself will become revolutionary, but we say inside the Labour Party will be a growth of a revolutionary tendency, and eventually that tendency will become a mass tendency, and of course, at some stage, the reformist either will split off or the revolutionary movement will split off. And then that, then you could have a mass revolutionary party in that country. And, that's, and that was Ted's perspective, and that's gen, in general our perspective at this stage. I think the um, Leninist idea of revolution is a disaster. And there's nothing to learn from it but not to do it. Um, how much time do we have? Uh, it, it, is a, um, it is a machinery for the establishment of a new ruling class um, that substitutes itself for uh, an actual populace um, and has been responsible for much of the slaughter of the last century. It's a bad place to start, people. There's no way to fix it. It's fundamentally wrong. Um, about Jacksonian democracy, the democratic part of Jacksonian democracy uh, is admirable. I don't mean I, I don't mean to say that the, the the animating spirit of the Occupy movement is without any precedent. It, it's it's the, the totality of the movement is striking to me, more striking than the precursors, although the precursors are many. Um, and certainly one of the, you know, one, one spirit of Jacksonian democracy that I admire is the rambunctiousness of it, it's the upheaval part of it, it's the self-invention part of it, it's the artisanship inside it, um, all of that, I think it has to be admitted, predates the existence of industrial capitalism. And the classes that were responsible for Jacksonian democracy, for the most part, no longer exist. So uh, there it is. I mean, it's sort of, we should hold to whatever animating spirit we 
history as inspiration, but I think that's not awfully helpful when it comes to imagining um, where we go from here, because our situation is in so many ways um, unprecedented, including you know globalization and interdependence and so on and so forth. Um, about Occupy, um, what I meant to say about its popularity is that I think it was self it was self evident to everybody but journalists, uh, at least in the few, first few months, that what the Occupy movement stood for, and that's why it was greeted as an inspiration. What it stood for was a repeal of the political power of the plutocracy. It didn't matter that people in Occupy had different political sentiments and that they had different lists of preferred reforms. It was perfectly evident what it, what it stood for. And, and I think that remains the case. If that, if that animating, that is, you know, I observed on the big march on October 5th, which was the one with, where the members of unions and Move On and various other groups joined it. It was the march that went from Zuccotti Park to uh, Foley Square. Uh, there were two chants that, I mean, there were lots of chants that went up on the march, but there were, there were two that people really got into and stuck with and which lasted longer than the others. And, and one of them was, we are the 99%. Not we are the working class. We are the 99%. The other was um, banks got bailed out, we got sold out. Those were those two were both unmistakable. Those were you know they were the bread and roses or the the peace bread and lamb of our moment. And you know as long as the Occupy movement can find a way to embody those values, I think it continues to have a life. If it doesn't. Um, then it does. I, I just, I see a lot of hands. I just have to ask one really quick thing, though, uh, to, to Tom and to Ross, too. Um, you know, I, I think I hear, um, Tom, especially what you're saying, um, but what if Todd is right here, that not only is there not a working class, if they're, let's say that not only is there not a working class, but the Lenin is the wrong place to start. What's the response to well, well, first, first of all, the working class exists. It's a question of consciousness, you know, uh, you know, like the question of the 99 percent, which is kind of a more populist uh, slogan. I think it's actually a very good slogan, but it's a populist kind of slogan. Uh, but, but the thing is, is, just because that slogan exists, that doesn't negate the fact that there is 100 million plus people who have to work. And they have to work every day, and they and they and they and they depend on their wages and benefits in order to live. No, no, you're, and that's, 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 that's a, wait, you, thank you for cutting me off. I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 that, that class, that class exists, um, whether that class is conscious of itself as a class or not. That class exists. The question of Leninism, we'd have to get you know he, what he's referring to. This is the old line that Leninism equals Stalinism, which is very popular, you know, in the bourgeois, you know, and, and through various you know segments of. The, so-called radical milieu. But the fact is we, we would have to discuss the Soviet Union, what happened, what went wrong in the Soviet Union. The Bolsheviks didn't expect to build socialism in the Soviet Union. They thought it was the beginning of a world revolution. Revolution did spread. The reason it was defeated in Germany in 1918, 1919, uh, Hungary in 1919, and a whole series of other countries was because they didn't have that leadership. So therefore, they were isolated, it was a poor backward country, they suffered four years of civil war, a bureaucratic caste grew, and that was led by Stalin. They massacred all the Bolsheviks, so they killed all the Bolsheviks. They would have killed Lenin, but he was already dead. Um, and, uh, and so there's a river of blood, that, there's a river of blood between Stalinism and Leninism. But that, that argument, you can buy millions of books that will argue what, what Mr. Gitlin is basically saying. Yeah, I mean, Picking up on that, like the, the slogan of the 99% is a sort of like new subject uh, for emancipation. I mean, perhaps integrates social elements in a sort of sociological sense that um, might otherwise be uh, separated qualitatively. I mean, I think it's kind of crude in terms of a, uh, like purely quantitative division. 
Um, and I think it's also misleading to characterize any social struggle as the 99% versus the 90, versus the 1%, when actually, like any sort of revolutionary struggle would necessarily involve a struggle of say the 99% versus the 99% to become to become the 99%. I mean, otherwise, like in terms of the actual occupations and the demonstrations, like it's often been pointed out that the number of people actually participating regularly in them, you know. If that actually equaled one percent of the total population, I mean that's that's a very optimistic estimate. <laughs> I mean, but but I mean that's not to, that's not to negate their importance or the importance of this. I mean, in a sort of de facto way, they've become a sort of like even though they've disavowed any sort of like leadership on a sort of a methodological scale, um, they've become a sort of de facto. Uh, vanguard of like ideals, of ideals against a sort of uh, ruling, prevailing injustice of society. Uh, whether they're, they're conscious of that fact is another question. With regard to Leninism, um, I think that a number of factors, historical factors, need to be taken into account, many of which Tom just alluded to. Uh, the, the capitulation of, so, of German social democracy to uh, German imperialism uh, in the lead up to World War I, um, the, and a number of other factors, which, I mean, ultimately the fact that we call it the Russian Revolution is a sign that it failed. Because it was never intended to just be the Russian Revolution, it was intended to be a world revolution. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think we should move on to other questions. Um, so, can I get Lisa and Matt here, and then Cam and then we And if we could just keep them brief, uh, just so we can get through as many as possible. Sure. My, my question is primarily for Professor Gitlin about, um, about capitalism, essentially. And um, you spoke about it not being a totality, um, and yet it's clear that the global economy is incredibly interconnected. Um, if we look at the collapse of Bear Stearns in 2007, um, I mean, for a, for a long time, I mean, Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson were saying the crisis is contained. The crisis is contained. And when you say that there are situations, right, and that we just need to respond to situations rather than um, have some kind of some kind of larger global phenomenon that that um, that we, you know, that is, you know, basically that we're entirely caught up in. Um, I just have a question about then what is outside the global economy? I mean, can you, like, because it seems to me that almost everybody was affected by that crisis except for um, you know, maybe a few tribes of hunter-gatherers. And the other thing is that, I mean, to me, that seems like the fact that, and I'm gonna call it capitalism, the fact that it comes into those kind of crises, the fact that it comes into contradiction with itself, I mean, that is so much, I mean, the resistance of the collapse of Bear Stearns was much, a much stronger resistance than anything that we've seen on the left. I mean, it's like, in a sense, there's what I'm seeing in some ways is a global economy that's coming into resistance with itself. And I think um, when you talked about the left as being culturally successful, a, a political failure, that sounds to me like what Walter Benjamin said about the aestheticization of politics. Politics is an art form which he connected to fascism and an element of fascism. So I'm just sort of wondering how much of you know, just the left as a, as a lifestyle or, or art form just is more, a lot more conservative than we like to admit, and a lot more just serving essentially the dominant. I mean, when you said that American culture was, you know, the, in a sense, the left was, you know, was American culture, that's how the left succeeded. Um, I mean, that is incredibly, to me, like a, that makes the left sound like incredibly reactionary and conservative, right? And just simply, simply like you, like helping um, capitalism reproduce itself through its own crises, essentially. Um, I mean, uh, rather than actually um, moving a situation forward that could, could transform and produce something else. I mean, I'm, I, I know this is supposed to be a short question, I'm done, <laughs> so. Uh, thanks, uh, I'm Mark, I'm on with the Workers Internationally along with uh, Tom and Parker here. Um, I'm going to actually bounce right off of that. The, um, 
the idea of capitalism. You know, capitalism at one point played a historically progressive role. It actually built up the means of production to give us buildings like this to, you know, all sorts of uh, goodies like my shoes and stuff. And uh, you know, and, you know, institution, in, institutions of education, be able to, the, the ability to house house people, educate people, etc. But um, ultimately, you know, if you actually understand the uh, the way capitalism works. Uh, basically, the two limits that it reaches, basically, I think uh, Marx described it, uh, the crisis of overproduction as being um, the revolt of the uh, productive forces against the mode of production. So capitalism as a mode of production, the way it actually works, is in contradiction to actually what it creates, you know, to the, uh, the potential that it creates, and that's what leads to crisis. So uh, the idea of capitalism not existing or not needing to be overthrown I think historically it needs to happen if humanity is going to continue, really. And um, and also sort of the relevance of Leninism is I would say, uh, you know, if you look at the history of Bolshevism or Marxism in general, you know, specifically with Bolsheviks, the, uh, it's interesting that we're discussing, you know, reform, uh, resistance, and revolution today because that's sort of what the Bolsheviks were forged in, you know, that whole uh, discussion. Uh, it's come up a few times, the idea of the uh, Second International, with uh, Edward Bernstein, the theoretician of uh, reformism within the uh, German SPD. And if you look at uh, economism, which you could say is sort of, uh, was sort of the idea of resistance, the idea that uh, everything should take place in the drab everyday struggle of you know, trade union work. And also, if you look at also the Narodniks, the sort of uh, anarchist or uh, you know, terrorist sort of methods, uh, you know, Bolshevism was actually forged arguing against these different sort of tendencies. And, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not connected, as, uh, as Tom said, that you know, all, all three of them are actually sort of integrated in a dialectical way. And if you look at, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to stand on a street corner and proclaim you know, the need for revolution. And, uh, and even in the midst of a revolutionary situation, and I, I would argue that a revolution happens objectively. It's not, it's not a revolutionary party that creates a revolution. It's capitalism that creates a revolutionary situation. Mark, can I just ask you if there's like a, just to wrap up, there's like a question just for the panel. And then it's you, uh, thanks. I actually don't have any questions. So it's <laughs> a lot of good points. Um, I had a question. I think that there is um, maybe some commonalities as to the way in which um, both panelists, uh, Todd and remind me of your name, sir, uh -huh. um, have um, digested the early 20th century history in terms of like the problem of bureaucracy. There seems to be, although you disagree. Um, with how we should learn mm -hmm. from this period, the conceptualization of it in terms of like the leadership, um, you know, not, uh, I guess, living up to the potentially more radical um, constituency, um, and in this case, the leadership replacing um, the people. But I, I was wondering, because since I agree with Lisa in terms of um, if one thinks about the new left as some kind of like, Victory. I mean, it may be a turn more towards sort of conservative version of the left. If you know, we need to really think about what this potentially revolutionary opening in the early 20th century was about. And it seems like I'm not satisfied. I guess, even though I agree with a lot of the points that Tommy had to say, that the problem is like the leadership. That like this becomes a sort of caricature of itself. That like is the lesson of history, you know, like the radical left, like the problem of like the bureaucracy, the problem of leadership, because to a large extent, like then Occupy in terms of today is like an adequate response to that problem because the Occupy movement, at least to the extent that it has some kind of conscious politics, is all about sort of insisting on forms of horizontalism, etc. cetera. Um, now, the last point that I'll make, it struck me because you, uh, Todd, started to say that the new left, like what made it new, was its forms of action, and as part of that, like I imagine that you know we're talking about a, a real criticism of like particular types of forms of leadership of the old left and new forms of sort of democratic participation, and to a large extent that has been naturalized in movements like Occupy, but did that aspect of the new left was it successful? I mean, we still live on this side of capitalism, and so to what extent, meaning there seems to be a very thorough indigestion of like what actually failed. Like why wasn't the revolution successful in the early 20th century? 
And that question seems to be bound up with the forms of politics that the left has taken throughout the 20th century. And there are like different answers, I guess, here on the panel. And yeah, anyway, um, I guess the question is how does one sort of deal with the fact that in the early 20th century, there was a possibility for revolution. To a large extent, the 20th century has been about figuring out what went wrong. And is that like also part of occupying the present? Like, how is that a response? Sorry. Um, I, there was, can I respond? Sure, sure. yeah, yeah. 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 Pile up is, here's my quick history of the 20th century, the socialist study of the 20th century. Uh, there was a plausible idea at work in Europe. The, the idea was social democracy. The idea was coming to power through uh, the expansion of democratic rights. It was not a stupid idea. There was really only one fundamentally wrong thing about it, which is that Bush came to shove in 1914, the social democratic parties decided they preferred nationalism to socialism, and they voted war credits, and they therefore uh, assassinated themselves as a, as a historical force. Okay. Then enter Lenin, who had a ready-made prepackaged answer to the problem. The problem was reformism, and the solution was Bolshevism. Also not a stupid idea, and it actually had a practical use. That is to say, under certain circumstances, it made it possible for a Bolshevik party to come to power. There's only one problem. Lenin invented the gulag. I view this as a discredited answer to a genuine problem. Nothing positive to be learned in, in my view. Secondly, about capitalism, the, your, your, your question. About in my view, what happened in the last five years was the, I mean, I don't, I, I, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy for what you're saying. There was a, a self, there was an implosion of an untenable system of finance-dominated capital. It, 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 it and, and it is now widely understood, although not widely enough understood, that that is what, um, that, that it was a system, that what it amounted to was a system of self-dealing, of, um, uh, of, Plutocratic rule, which uh, which could do no good. Okay, um, in my view, though, what was discredited was not capitalism as a principle of ownership, but as a, a determinate form of cap. What was discredited was a particular version of capitalism, which deserved to be discredited. Um, and what follows from that, I think, is, you know, somebody referred to glass people left. Um, you know, the, a reformist program of re restoring the glass people Act and taxing financial transactions and so on would, I think, require major political force to accomplish and ought to be accomplished, and is a very good program for the continuation of the Occupy movement. I don't think it's finished, by the way. I think we just went through one phase of it. I, I would anticipate that somewhere out of the great whirlwind of Occupy, there will come reformist projects that actually uh, can gather a large amount of support. Now, just one other I want to make conceptually. Um, there are hundreds of million, there are billions of workers. I'm not disputing that. What I'm disputing is that there is such a thing as can be called the working class. Marx's concept of class is a borrowing from Hegel. It's an abstraction. And it is, as some Marxists like to say, no accident that Marx abandoned capital, the book, at exactly the point where he was trying to formulate 
a usable theory of class. He couldn't do it. It can't be done. He, I think, was honest enough to quit at that point because the, the notion that of class for itself versus class in itself was a German philosophical trick. It actually had no, when push came to shove, it had no practical applicability. I think the left, the Marxist left, has lived for more than a century now on the myth of the working class. And it's a, you know, it's a noble myth, and it's a myth. If I could just respond to a few of the historical points. I mean, what came to be known as the Gulag was not invented by Lenin. Um, there was an established prison system throughout Siberia that was actually uh, an inheritance of, of czarism, uh, which then later, under various bureaucratic uh, manifestations, came to be known as uh, the Gulag system that we all have read about. Um, also, in terms of uh, the sort of uh, demands for a, a reform in, or a restoration of something like the Glass-Steagall Act, you know, greater, a greater degree of re regulation, taxation, etc. I mean, perhaps that would, to some extent, uh, rein in the, uh, the sort of uh, the, the, the forces of uh, you know, the forces of uh, neoliberal capitalism unbound, as it were. Um, it would return to a sort of uh, new, new, like new, new deal type Keynesianism. Um, but I think that it fails, first of all, to explain why Keynesianism itself failed, and second of all, why Occupy has so almost universally rejected the idea of closing demands. Almost, I mean, there were there were sort of faint murmurings for demands early on, but that's by and large been been abandoned. Um, thirdly, um, in terms of uh, in terms of Lenin in 1917 uh, having a sort of like prefabricated like plan, you know, he knew exactly how things were going to unfold. I think that that's a mischaracterization. First of all, the, the sort of anti-reformist platform had been mapped out before Lenin by Luxembourg. Um, he built upon that, her writings and his writings against the economists in 1902 with what is to be done. But the convergence of uh, Lenin and Trotsky in a moment like 1917, who had been political rivals in the interim, was it's often interpreted as just the idea that um, Trotsky became a Leninist, right? But actually, part of what happened was that Lenin became more of a Trotskyist, insofar as one can talk about either Leninism or Trotskyism at this point. Um, Lenin, when he arrived in April, you know, actually substantially revised earlier positions that he had about the sort of uh, dictatorship of the peasants and proletariat um, in combination with each other. Um, but I mean, these are, these are just sort of uh, historical facts of you know, interpretation of I think that it deserves mention. May I just Did offer one brief clarification? I wasn't talking about Siberia. I'm talking about the prison island that was Lenin's idea, where um, I don't know the numbers, but really many thousands of people were uh, incarcerated under very brutal conditions. An island north of the Arctic Circle, whose name escapes you now, but it begins with S, and something like Sovietsky or something. That's what I'm they're not the remnants of the Soros system. Well, it, that, that island that you're referring to, I mean, it was like expanded in terms of like its capacity uh, substantially, but it was it was a sort of it was it did have a prisoner role. It was it also had a a uh, it was also a monastic establishment. Well, so let me just let uh, Thomas yeah. just to some of the questions here. Well, well just uh, your question is a very good question. But to tell you the truth, we need a whole night just to discuss that in, in the detail that it really deserves. But in the very short form, what I would say is this. There's a combination of reasons why the revolution has not succeeded, to be blunt, over the, over the past decade. There, are there, are, there were weaknesses. Human beings are not perfect people, right? We learn and through, through, uh, through practice, right? And, um, and, and there were mistakes made. There were, there, there were sabotage in some cases of 
some revolutions, like if you look at Spain in the 1930s, there could have been a successful working class uh, 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 take, taking of a uh, you know, socialist revolution in Spain. Instead, Franco was, was, uh, was victorious. And that's, in, I think, because of the Stalinists and what they did in that particular revolution. So we could look at the different things. But like, for example, take a look at the question of the second international, the socialist international. It began as a Marxist international, but it grew up at a time when, you, when uh, world capitalism was going through a number of decades of growth. And it was prosperous, at least in the, in the imperialist countries, right? So as a result, as a byproduct of the struggle and the growth of the socialist international, the, um, the working class won reforms. They won higher wages, they won unions, they won this, they won that. But there was also, a as these parties grew, there were a layer of these parties that were in parliament, there were layers that became union leaders, they started living a little higher on the hog, and they became, uh, you know, went into this idea, they said, well, it's worked for two, three decades, it'll just continue to work this way, and they basically left the Marxist path in terms of the method of Marxism and started to adapt to capitalism, and they became basically reformers. And then, of course, when the crisis hit in the form of World War I, then, of course, they were disoriented and they, and they ended up capitulating because they'd already kind of capitulated to, to their ruling class. So, but to answer that question, really, it, 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 you know, we'd have to go through a, a lot of details of which revolutions we're talking about and which, and which uh, circumstances. Now, I just also wanted to question this question on Occupy. I, I think, by the way, it's a terrific movement. We've been active in it uh, since the beginning. Um, it was great to see a layer of young people becoming politicized and becoming radicalized. And I do think their demand the, you know, the pitting of 1% versus 99%. What does that mean? What are we talking about? talking about personal property. The 1%, by the way, in this country, the richest 1%, owns more than the bottom 95% in this country. And that, though, I think in those statistics, they include people who own their private homes and stuff. And if you actually just looked at stock ownership or something, it'd be, it would be a lot worse. So I thought that that was a very good slogan. It was a very positive movement in many ways. And as we said, it was also, um, um, it, it was inspired by what happened in Egypt, etc. But I'll tell you this, I think there is some missing points of the Occupy movement also. I, I think it would be better, for example, for them to talk about an alternative, to talk about socialism, whatever, whatever they may mean about, by socialism, but to put forward an alternative. The fact that they don't is ideologically a, a concession they're making to the ruling class and to capitalism, in my opinion. The second thing I think they should do is they should call on the labor leaders, and unions have supported them. They should call on the labor leaders and say, and, and especially when they got some publicity to do this, they should say, you guys should run people in this upcoming election in November. We should have labor candidates, candidates. we should have worker candidates in this election. Go up against both big business parties. Both parties are for austerity, the Democrats and Republicans. Let's challenge them both, elect workers on a worker's wage. They'll only accept the average wage of a worker and donate the rest back to the movement. And, and the slogan can be, make the rich, make the 1% pay for their crisis. I think that, 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 that if they put that demand forward, I don't think the labor leadership would do it, but I think it would have a big impact in terms of organizing an opposition in the labor movement. So I think that that would be a really positive thing. Okay, uh, do I have more than one at the time? My question, uh, and then, yeah, we'll as, uh, the same as possible is for Ross. Um, you've mentioned that uh, some sort of regression in, uh, and I, I'm familiar somewhat with my position on this, of uh, revolution actually going backwards. Uh, I think the way you put it is that we're no longer thinking of a violent rupture. Um, so my question is, how do you explain from that framework the existence of things like uh, the Arab Spring? Which, I mean, the very fact that we call it an Arab Spring at least acknowledges in my mind that we're not ready to talk about revolutions as revolutions because we're still married to the idea, well, it's not going to happen again. Um, how do you explain you know, the revolutionary uh, sweep across the Arab world and the uh, growing calls for revolution, uh, whether it's successful or not, but certain calls for at least uh, revolution or growth in communist parties in, in uh, Europe? Um, yeah, hold on. No, so so I have two brief questions. Sorry, fixing camera. Um, I have two brief questions. One is uh, I'm sort of curious just about you know, whether or not the panelists like the, uh, the formulation, reform, revolution, resistance, three R's. I, I would just sort of like a, a yay or nay as to the three, or, or maybe just like a, a way of sort of simplifying and condensing some of the arguments would be sort of like, which of these three do you think has further relevance? 
Um, do they all three need to be in combination? Is one sort of like useless? It's about time we goddamn well got rid of this concept. Um, like, I, I think I probably have some guesses as to what you'd say, but I'm interested in like brief, direct, to the point um, sort of positions from the three of you on that. Uh, the other thing, and I think this is mostly directed towards Todd, um, though not exclusively, somewhat to Ross too, and to Tom, so everybody, uh, is the issue of sort of fetishism of tactics, I'd say, sort of, you know, fetishism in the, the good Freudian sense, you know, the licking the toe that should be part of a whole sexual experience becomes the, the sole um, experience. <laughs> I think <laughs> there's... You know, it, it seems to me Ross brought up the language of strategy and tactics, right? So broadly, the left has seemingly some sort of broad goal for society, um, something it conceives of, a strategy for reaching it, and sort of tactics. And Todd, I think, spoke very well about the importance of those tactics being themselves sort of meaningful, of them having, in, in some ways, sometimes a very direct relationship to the end goal. But I think a classic problem that's come up in the history of the left has been when sort of tactics get hived off from any larger um, position. So things like workers' cooperatives, which themselves can be very pleasurable, which themselves can show a new way for people to interact with each other, become basically ends in themselves rather than broader ways for introducing people to a movement. It would be sort of like if the sit-ins had happened like instead of a civil rights movement, or if they'd been sort of the only thing that the civil rights movement had been. Um, and I feel like a theme on the left, certainly in the last 40 to 50 years, in a time of great reaction, has been trying to regenerate a broader left culture from you know, innovative tactics and from enjoyable tactics. And my worry is that Occupy falls into that sort of broader sweep, which is the hope that through relatively good, pleasurable tactics that like introduce people to sort of radical, more cooperative forms of life and ideas, um, we'll be able to generate the broader term strategy and, in some sense, a common set of goals Jerry, that we want to see achieved. Sorry, that's, that's it. Okay. Just that's it. I'm okay. done. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, my question is pretty quick, and I suppose it's mostly for Tom, but I mean, I guess it's sort of a general question. Um, the Economist this past week, I think rather presciently, um, ran a cover story about the third industrial revolution, which focused um, on a very tangible, very, palp uh, very palpable growth in the labor movement, or I mean, maybe even a setback, in the um, creation of 3D printers, which run on their own, need very little supervision, except by perhaps office bureaucrats, office drones, to the point where it may become even inconceivable in the not that distant future that we would even need a skilled labor workforce or even a working class to begin with. Um, so what would the future hold past the working class, I, I guess, is my question. Uh, I won't let you guys respond to these, um, but after this response, are there any other questions? Because if there aren't, then I'll ask you guys to include some kind of closing remark with this, um, if there are no other questions after this. Okay, so yeah, go ahead and respond to this and also treat it as a kind of concluding remark. Okay. Well, I, uh, I think, I, I, I already told you why I think revolution is the wrong concept. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think reform, I, and I think I already told you why I think resistance is not really a concept or not really a useful concept. But that's not to say that I think reform is awfully helpful either because the range of conceivable reforms is so great that it, 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 this would be it, 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 to, to me, there's too much conceptual work being laid on one word there. If, if, if you're asking me, though, what, what, what's, what would I prefer? Do I have anything else to offer? I, I mean, this is, not, this is not a political program, what I'm about to say, but it's a, to me, it's a rubric or a pointer to what I think we're in and, and the best thing that we can be in would be more like a reformation because it would speak to 
the uh, development and living out of values. That, I think, is what could be in the cards. Um, and obviously, that I don't mean that to say that solves any problems, but it's a it's a room to, to it, it, it's a it's a space to walk around in, and that that to me feels enlivening. And on that note, what to me is enlivening about Occupy is not that it had answers, or not that it. What, what to me matters about Occupy was that it was a form of action that actually represented a life force in what was otherwise a great inertia, a great deadness. That to me, you see, to me, to go back to my earliest point, the point is not what to affirm as an article of faith. The point is to form, to, to arrive at forms of action which create, which are creative, and uh, that's what the civil rights movement did. It's not that it solved problems; it solved, it did solve some problems, and it generated some new problems. And you know what? There's nobody here at home on Earth but problems. This is, you know, there is no final conflict. I'm sorry, I've given up on that metaphysic. I'm not sorry. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I think Occupy deserves celebration because it happened. It was not a, a it was not a, 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 it was not a text. It was something that developed in history. Yeah, um, in, in terms of, uh, revolutions today, uh, I think that the concept still remains as a sort of, in its political sense. Um, although it's kind of, I, I think it would be still premature to uh, talk about the Arab Spring or the political transformations it brought about as complete. Um, I think that the elections and I would say in large part the collusion of, uh, of the uh, Egyptian military with, uh, with ultra-reactionary uh, forces uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, um, pose new, new uh, problems that are, you know, potentially just as bad as, I mean, and, it, and admittedly, like, stagnant and uh, oppressive system like that of Mubarak. Um, I don't think that it's insignificant, and to be honest, I remain quite, quite uh, hopeful about what something like the Arab Spring represents. Um, but in terms of the broader project of revolution, like revolution with a sort of capital R, um, I think that it's lost a lot of its, of its clarity of meaning, uh, and I think that that's large, that largely has to do with whether or not we think that it's actually possible. Uh, revolution in the sort of old sense of the sort of like as a sort of radical break with with that which which came before, and I think it's kind of interesting tying back into uh, the, the question of resistance um, and uh, some of the points that were made about machinery and and the sort of superfluity of, of labor uh, in in large part is that Marx himself singles out. Uh, resistance in the Communist Manifesto as one of the, the main the main obstacles to realizing a socialist society. In fact, he talks in other places about the Luddites who, it can't be doubted, I mean, they were resisting new forms of, of, of capitalist production that were, that was uh, disenfranchising them, that was uh, co uh, moving them into uh, unemployment. But at the same time, their, their reaction to it was their form of resistance was reactionary. They didn't realize the potential freedoms that could be opened up by, by mass production through, through machine implements. And I think that actually that's the point of, of the revolution, the sort of like classical Marxist sense, in the, in the sense that it's at its most profound, is that the goal of the working class is not to make everybody part of the 
class. It's to create a classless society. In many ways, it's, it's to abolish its own existence as a class. And there's the, and the old truism that only wage laborers can abolish wage labor. I think that that's true. Um, but I, I think that a lot of the clarity of that has been lost, or how do you even attain that? Um, with respect to the Occupy movement, and I'll, I'll close with this, um, there's a sort of odd mean, means ends reversal um, that's taken place. And this speaks some, somewhat to the fetishization of tactics. Tact a sort of broader strategy um, for either overthrowing existing power, which would, which would be sort of like the, the extent of the sort of anarchist ultimate strategy, at least classical anarchism, or of overthrowing traditional authority, the, the state, etc., and then installing a, a sort of transitional state that would aim at its own redundancy, at its own withering away. Um, the, that is the sort of ultimate goal for both anarchism and, and Marxism has become opaque. In the sense that direct confrontation with the existing state, the overthrow of the existing state, is no longer really opposed. In fact, most of the confrontations with the state are ones that are almost kind of like exercises in martyrdom. They don't have the sort of same tragic depth that like the slaughter of 25,000 uh, communards in, in, in Paris 1871 had, where it was like a, a real attempt to transform all of the world. It's rather this sort of like repetition compulsion, this sort of traumatic experience of getting, of getting arrested repeatedly. And there is no real prospect of overthrowing or dismantling the Constitution or the federal government or the, the world, uh, you know, you know, network of, of state structures. So I, I would say, for that reason, the movement towards the abolishing these things has become a sort of end in itself, and it's become a sort of closed loop. And I think that that uh, the success of any sort of emancipatory politics of achieving human freedom in the future would require a sort of breaking free of that that sort of you know closed circuit and and advancing a more general program of emancipation throughout all of society, internationally. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly if that can be accomplished without first building or rebuilding a, a mass movement, workers' movement, etc. Okay, first, in terms of the um, Industrial Revolution, I mean the, the Third Industrial Revolution, capitalism, one of the things about capitalism is it's constantly um, uh, it's seeking technological innovation so they can improve productivity. You know, it's a way of expanding, expanding the production of commodities and so they can sell it at a cheaper price to out-compete uh, their competitors, right? So that's part of the dynamic of the system. Now, what you notice is during periods when you have an expansion of capitalism, for example, the post-World War II boom from 45 to 75, when you're in that kind of period, Usually what happens is, yes, the technology eliminates jobs or changes jobs, makes them uh, uh, you know, uh, um, less, uh, less skilled and necessary in order to do that job. But then it also new products and new commodities and new industries are formed so they employ pe you know, people in other sectors. That's during a period of expansion. When you're in a period of decline like now, when you have that, ha when, when that kind of technology is used, all that does is the net effect usually is to help to increase the unemployed. And in this country right now, we have, according to, if you look at the unemployed and the underemployed, and you know, the, the U6 figures from the United States Department of Labor, we're trying about more than 25 million people right now. This is two years into the, so in the recovery, we have 25 million people who are unemployed or underemployed in this country right now. That, that will grow over the next period. Look at uh, the, the, now, there, there will always be a certain amount of people who, who are working that keep society functioning. It doesn't have to be a lot of people, as long as they have strategic power, that they can have an impact on society. If everyone remembers here, I think probably everyone remembers a few years ago, there was a transit strike in New York City. That 45,000 member, or maybe it's 30, 40,000 member, transit workers union, even though there's 17 million people who live in the metro area, that uh, 30,000 uh, member union was able to uh, uh, make a big impact in what was going on when they went on strike for a few days. 
So the power of the working class is not just the overall numbers, but it's, but it's the actual uh, 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 position it has in industry. Now also, let's talk about the, the crisis of capitalism. There are, there are people who, who think that you can just reform it. You know, uh, the speaker was talking, uh, uh, Mr. Gitlin was talking about the question of the Glass-Steagall Act and all this. See, there's always this dream that reformists have that you're going to make capitalism into something nice. It's like, it's like I'm going to have a pet tiger, but I want the tiger to eat lettuce. Can I train the tiger to eat lettuce? <laughs> well, tigers don't eat lettuce, okay? Capitalism functions the way it does because that's the kind of system it is. It has a, its uh, periods of growth, and then it has a periods of severe crisis. And, and what resolved the last crisis in the 1930s was, a, was an inter-imperialist war where 60 million people were killed in World War II, including all that Nazi genocide and all that, and, uh, and all that destruction that took place. That's what it took to create the post-World War II boom. Because war what does one thing, it destroys overproduction, it destroys overcapacity, and that, it did very well. You know, but, but that's what we saw in the last period. Now what is it going to take to get this crisis, and you know, the capitalists, in, when they're in a crisis of overproduction, they have to destroy capacity, they have to destroy productive facilities. What is that going to mean? How is that going to happen? What is the effect on millions and millions of people, uh, millions and millions of people? How is that going to affect them? What is going to be their response? Are they just going to sit there and take it? No, not forever. People will fight back, and people are fighting back, and you see this in Europe. Now, the question is this, do, do, does anyone here think the Glass-Steagall Act is going to solve the problems of American capitalism and that are facing the millions of people in this country, or the 25 million people. How about Spain and Italy? Those countries may go bankrupt. Is the Glass-Steagall Act going to solve that problem? You know, you're, you're talking about the entire Eurozone may fall apart at some stage, right? Because, because of the crisis in Europe. I mean, you're, you're talking about a crisis of state solvency. In the New York Times yesterday, they talked about in Spain, they have a worse real estate bubble than was in the United States. The banks are, 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 are teetering, but the problem is the Spanish government cannot bail out the banks like the American government could, because Spain itself is, 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 on, is on the verge of bankruptcy. So the fact is, is that all of these things are going to create a tremendous amount of struggle and a tremendous change in consciousness, not only in, the, in, in worldwide, but also here in the United States. And just let's, let's put ourselves in the back. You know, we can live here in the United States. We accept the United States as a given, right? This is accomplished fact, the United States of America. Wasn't always accomplished fact. What, could, what do you think Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty, when they started talking about, you know, being free of the British, you think that was popular? Do you think everybody accepted that that would happen? No. It, it, a lot of people say that's pie in the sky, that's a dream, you know, that'll never happen. But a revolution did happen in this country, and we established a, a, a separate country, separate from Britain. And also, look at the Civil War. Look at what happened there. I'm sure there were people who said slavery has always existed for thousands of years and always will exist. But eventually, it was, put, it was put to an end because of the, the outgrowth of the contradictions between the, the pre-capitalist mode of production of slavery and capitalism, and that created the, the conditions that led to civil war and reconstruction, and we had an end to slavery in this country. These kinds of things, this is the way history progresses. This is the way history moves. Now, the question people in this room have to ask themselves is, what do you want to be, how do you want to be a part of that solution? How do you want to change this society? Can we, can we change the society, or do we have to accept it uh, and, and, and as a given, and that this will always exist, and, and, and the, there's never any alternative? I, I would also say this, the, the slanders about Lenin and all this stuff. You make up your own mind. Read, read, there's a lot of stuff you can read about what the conditions were that the Bolsheviks faced and all this. The, the, this, this propaganda that we heard tonight, the, the, this is a, a, a cottage industry of capitalism that's existed since the beginning of the Russian Revolution and before the Russian Revolution. The main message they want to say is the working class is too stupid to run society. That's basically what they want to say. And, and, uh, and, and in fact, the working class, I don't think, I think they are the people that make society run. And once they become conscious of their power, we can live in a different society, a much more democratic society than the one we live in, and a society that doesn't have to go from crisis to crisis. Okay, uh, so let me uh, just, for, I just want to thank the panelists quickly. Um, you know, we've, Platypus is nothing without its uh, panels and therefore its panelists, so thank you for speaking. Um, quickly, um, there are Platypus reviews over there in the corner. They're all free, so please grab whatever you like. Um, we have an event coming up on the 7th. Uh, uh, Richard Walling, Pam had already noted, as uh, giving a brief talk on his book that was published recently. There are a few sandwiches over there. Uh, if anybody wants anything, go ahead and grab it. Um, and I think Tom wanted to make an yeah. announcement. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, Worker is an international uh, league literature as well. Yes, the Workers International League has literature there. Please uh, take a look. There's books, booklets, and papers. And also, is there anyone here from Hunter College? The reason I'm asking is because we're having uh, something going on.